Go Loud presents the Talking Bollocks podcast. Go Loud! Go Loud! What you waiting for? What you back in it? Just a little more. Oh, you yeah, with it now. Fill your body, your head. Walk it hard and long. When you finish that. The hip knocker. Boom! Episode 37 of the Talking Bollocks Podcast brought to you by Go Loud, the home of Irish podcast. It's me, Terry Flower. It's me, CLB. And this week, we're joined by... Brian Penny. Brian, how are you? How's things? I'm doing great, lads, yeah. really. This, as I said, this is a long time coming. I'm dying to get in for a chat. Very, really, very long time yeah, coming. Yeah, yeah. Legend, we've been trying to get Brian up for a few months now. He's a busy, busy man these days. Yeah, I think he, he knew what he was doing because when we first reached out to you, we were in the kitchen. I just want to come in for a chat. It now. looks like it, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> he sees the shields, yeah, and he's like, oh, he's like, are in my account. No, no, it's the PhD thesis, just taking yeah. up my life, yeah, but it's over the line, happy days. Once you mentioned the word thesis to me, bro, and I said to him, right, leave him. Don't he didn't even mention, don't talk to him at all. <laughs> say, stay away from him because I know how consumed you can get with them oh, things. Oh, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all consumed. And do, do you know what it was? Do you know what happened to me as well? We were chatting beforehand. It says there's a thin line between self belief and self delusion, right? So I wrote my book there two years ago. And I says, well, that was 80,000 words. And I wrote that in four months. I get my PhD done in three months. That was self delusion. Because yeah. it did not happen. <laughs> 10,000 words, is it? No, 60,000 60, words. Yeah, it's a PhD thesis. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no yeah. Ooh, it's like a Harry Potter book. It was a monster. And it was double the amount of work than the book because, well, 10 times that amount. But uh, just for the write up alone, it's just, it's a different animal, the academic stuff, you know what yeah. I mean? But, I enjoy it, but nice to have over the line at the yeah. same time. Yeah. No sense yeah. of accomplishment. Yeah, Again, big it just submit. Now, still have to defend it. Like, you yeah. know what I mean? So uh, it's not I won't, I won't pop, the, yeah. pop the cock just yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, Terrence. Right, Jumping into this. We do a thing called Jingles. Have you listened to the podcast? I have, before? I have, yeah. We do a thing called Jingles. It's like a would you rather, would you do this or would you do this? Have we... you brought one in for us now because I I'm struggling? No, I have a quick question for you. Do you piss in this show by any chance? No. No, I think they're a liar. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah, it's only two types of people in the world, Brian. People are pissed in the showers and lawyers. <laughs> yes, so you are spill for right. I'm a spill but for some. I think you're lying, mate. <laughs> zingers from that the zingers from last week were very bad, by the way. <laughs> we got a bit of stick over them, yeah. So if you're drunk, what do you call it when you're drunk? Do you call it locked or pissed? Pissed. Oh, yeah. it pushed that, isn't it? Yeah. Is it pissed? Yeah, is it? bro. No yeah. Locked, no, God. Yeah, rubber, it. rubber. Do you know what happened there? <laughs> rubber. Because <laughs> yeah. you moved over the south side, Brian. That's what that's it is. Well, yeah. Yeah, it's the taller part of the south side. <laughs> <laughs> it's still rough. <laughs> but uh, 79% of the people said locked, 21% of the people said pissed, yeah? Um, would you rather, Roy, would you rather, you're a Liverpool fan, yeah? Yeah. Would you rather Liverpool win the quadruple or Ireland qualify for the World Cup? Liverpool all the way, man. Liverpool oh, yeah. all the way, what all the, the way. What about the shitty being on wheels of country hopping? Oh, do you know what? Do you know what? Yeah, when you think about it that way, right, selfishly, it would be Liverpool all the way. But when yeah. you look at what it does to the economy and what it does for people and the lift it gives people, like yeah. you look at the Olympics and the buzz that we had with the Olympics. Yeah. yeah for, for the others, I'd say Ireland. But... I don't know, Liverpool is just, it's, it feels like it's in my blood for some reason. It wasn't, and, and you know what, I can't can't get my head around why so many Irish people are so mad for English football. Like, when you think about mm. it, you know what I mean? But it's just something following them since I'm five years of age. And when I got clean, I was thinking, right, because I, when, I, when I was an addict and all, I, I, I was a big drinker and loving the football. And when I got clean, I didn't think I'd be mad for that. But it just lights that fire inside me. I don't yeah. know what it is, it's mad. Yeah, a bit of shame. Now, I, I sort of sometimes wish I was a big Irish football fan. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, because yeah. Because like, we support... Liverpool, we support the English. I'd love to be, but I think sometimes I think oh, it's too late to just jump on board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd love go, to grow up. Since I'm having tall, I'll go to the Rovers game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, anyways, 22% of the people said the quadruple, and 78% of the people said they'd rather Ireland qualify oh, for the yeah. World Cup. This is a bad one. Emma Brennan, this is dirt. Would you rather always be itchy or always be sticky? <laughs> just sticky. Yeah, no, yeah. 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 Sticky is a better one. Sticky is better, yeah. Imagine lying in bed and you're just itchy, itchy all the time. All the time. Oh, yeah, I go with sticky, definitely. Someone gave a decent yoke, though, they said, at least you can scratch the itch, but it's always itchy, though. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Someone so, said, yeah. take an antihistamine. <laughs> Fair point, yeah. Yeah. Point, yeah. Yeah. No. But uh, 33 percent said itchy, 67 percent And a lot of people gave me stick about the one I said last week. I said that he called tea That's cakes are fairly cakes. 
But what happened was it was Terence's birthday last week. So when I said that he called tea cakes or fairy cakes, he was thinking, and I was like, what would you call this cake? And we stung him with a birthday cake, you know, like that. Yes. Nice. But people took him mad serious and were like, they're two different things. We're like, all right. <laughs> did you, Come on. I was setting him up to give him a fucking <laughs> yeah. birthday cake. <laughs> 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 people were sending us pictures and diagrams no, and graphs and everything. I was like, <laughs> That's what happens when you get bigger, you know? <laughs> oh, bro, man. But, uh, yeah, that's last week's English box stuff. Have you got this week's one? Yeah, it's a bad one. But it's not actually a bad one. People keep sending it yeah. and it's wrecking me. It's like the pressing cupboard thing, which is a shocking one. But what do you call it? Someone jumps on your back and you're carrying them. Jockey back. Yeah, jockey yeah, back. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. All the cultures, right? We love the cultures, right? But it's a very, very strange. But they're not just cultures. I've seen people from Dublin saying this as well. No, no. Go through I the comments. I can't even think of another name, but what's it? Yeah, well. So, here's the other name. Would you call her a jockey back or a jiggy back? A jiggy back. Yeah, yeah, never. The jiggy heard. smalls, fella. Notorious <laughs> <laughs> J-O-I-G. <laughs> <laughs> Look, that's, that's very bad. A that, jiggy isn't back. It? That's, a jiggy that's, back. It's a that's poor harsh, one. Yeah. But, but I'm actually excited to see the results on it because yeah. the amount of people that was like, it's a jiggy back. Yeah, there should be at least 20% of the people, but the feedback we've got should be calling yeah. it a jiggy back. But yeah, it is a bad one. It's a jockey back. A jockey, it's a jockey back. back. And it makes way. sense, you All know what I mean? Like jockeying somebody, like it makes yeah. sense. Yeah, jiggy, yeah, like what's yeah. jiggy, man? I'm with you on that one. Right, I suppose my one, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I actually had this one for last week, but because I sent you up with the cake, I said it all over this week. Uh, I was <laughs> again where I get most of my inspiration for Zingers. I was having an argument with my daughter who's six, so uh, she was in the bath, and I said, "Careful, don't uh, touch off the stopper to let the water out." And she goes, "What's the stopper?" I said, "That thing there that's gonna stop the water." Mm-hmm. And she was like, "That's called the plug," and I was like, "No, it's a stopper." Yeah. So it's, what's it's a stopper. Call it's, it's a stopper. It's a stopper. It's a stopper. Do you know what I think I would have said plug? What you think I would yeah. have said plug? Yeah. Yeah. I know because I've heard stopper. I would have known what a Is stopper that not was. What I actually call it like a bat stopper or a, a fucking bat stopper train or a stopper. plug. I don't know. No. Well, well so you're gonna say I'd plug. I said plug, I'd have said yeah. plug, yeah. No, it's a stopper. Yeah, and do you know what's plug. weird now? Because do you remember you used to have the, the stopper and you used to have to wrap it around the tap when you were finished? Remember you'd be on the chain? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're gonna talk about the fact? No, not the fact, but I'll let you, you can come back to me with that. <laughs> but we have a, a a decent, like a new bat. Yeah. Where you push the stopper down now. Do you know one of them that uh, pops up? Pops? Yeah, it pops up. Do you ever see them very ones? Very fancy. I have them now. now. Yeah, not going to lie. So uh, <laughs> when you get in the bat, it's very easy just to sit on it. You know, you might like bump yeah, off and it yeah, pop yeah. Like me head. Oh, Do you know, very you, now when you fill the bat, there's that water. silver yeah. thing under the taps yeah. with the holes in it. Do you know a stopper t- is supposed on. to pop onto that? That's yeah. what they're made for. Yeah. It just I don't pops know. It's it. not what they're made for because well, it wa- works. It works, but the water drains out of it. So it stops. Yeah, it's from overflow. Yeah. yeah. So, that's what that's made for. Right. Well, that's my fact of the day out the window. Absolutely anyways. butchered. <laughs> right. Mil- have you got a jingle for us, Brian? I don't. I don't, lads. I don't. Right. Some force. Moving on. You should have been more prepared, Brian, yeah? Calvin I did, love it. I will try when I can't believe I was only listening to it today was Lynn's uh, conversation with just put a Cordy sack. I've never heard of that one in my never. life. It's <laughs> it makes like, I think we should petition. Let's call it a Cordy yeah, sack from now on. Yeah, French. Calls around yeah. Cordy sack. I mean, Cordy sack. It's yeah. definitely called the Cordy sack. I was like, oh, I never ever heard of <laughs> it. I, I hadn't. I hadn't. I thought it was great. <laughs> <laughs> Boys, growing up, we used to always call it a Cordy sack. And it's only when I got old that and I seen the sign and it was like, called this sack. And I was yeah. like, oh, that's what that's, that's called. Fully <laughs> coolie sack made sense. Yeah, it in does. my head, I was it like, does. it makes sense. It calls around the back. It does make sense, but, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, right, sorry. DC gave us Dad and Clarity. Shout out to Dad. Are you going with that one, yeah? No, oh, is that what we're going with? Sorry, my yeah. bad. Are you going with something else? I'll come back to my one. Go right, ahead. Dad and gave us a, what's it, a riddle? What's this? No, what it was would you a call question. this? question. I wouldn't call it a riddle. Right, well, it's like a riddle. It's a question thing, yeah? So, what is the question that you asked us? So, uh, we were having a conversation about football before we come in here, and he hit us with a question. There's been four Irish players to win Premier League Player of the Month. Can you name them? So how do we know that? Dad Darren, made, Darren obviously gonna, let us know, yeah. But who did it? Roy, Roy Keane. Roy Keane. Has De- to be Roy Keane. Dennis Irwin. You gonna go with Irwin? Roy, Roy Keane, did Dennis you? Irwin. Did uh, he have player of the month back then? Would he? Have? Yeah, since yeah, the he Premier League didn't start, he? he would yeah. have had it. Robbie Keane would have definitely got one. No. I'd say I'd say so at some stage. I'd say given. Shea Shea given, yeah. Dad, let me on track. No. Right. Well, out of well, them four, well, well, how many have we got? Well, I wasn't Phil Bab. <laughs> Robbie and Robbie Roy. And Robbie Roy. And so Roy. Two, well, uh, he's lost. Roy, I have one. Uh, Paul McGrath. No. No. Shane Duffy. No. Uh, right back, Everton. Coleman. Seamus Coleman. 
absolutely grand. Um, <laughs> yeah. What the fuck is this? Duff. Duff. Oh, Quinner? No. Who? Who could it be? John O'Shea? No. Ray Houghton? No. Ray Houghton wouldn't have played Premier League. Yeah, yeah, they were a thing. Right, we're not going to get hung up on this for too long. Yeah, we give another get... 30 seconds or so, lads. Right, two us... more. Two more each, right? Right. Right, who's that? Ah, oh, man. Boys, my head is R- wrecked. Richard Dunn? No. Ian Hart? No. <laughs> Steve Finnan? No. <laughs> Centre midfielders, we're forgetting. Who's the... Sh- Glenn Whelan? No. Glenn... If Glenn... <laughs> if Glenn <laughs> Whelan <laughs> won player of the <laughs> month in the Premier League... <laughs> Honestly, if he ever won that, I'd never watch the league again in my life. <laughs> Um, right. John Walters. No. Absolutely grand. Matt Doherty. Fuck off. Oh, Matt Doherty. Oh. Pl- 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 yeah, I'll take that flip-flop down my mouth. <laughs> Premier League player of the month. Mickey Evans. Who? Never heard of him. Who's Mickey life. Evans? He's got a clatter. What? He had two caps in 1997 for Ireland. Two caps. And who did he win the player of the month for? Coventry, was it? Did he, yeah. That's a mad one, right? Well, that's well, that's that. Nice. We'll just move on now. Thanks yeah. for that. Absolutely, Grant. Sorry yeah, for the could, girls. We could have been there for two hours. Don't think there's a lot of girls could like football. Yeah, who don't um, like football? <laughs> well, uh, right, Grant. So somebody asked us before. So we touched on this when we only started on uh, many episodes. Or we only a handful of episodes we had about how many countries we are listening yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think we'd hit early on. We hit like twenty countries. We couldn't believe it. Yeah, and. It's only recently somebody mentioned it again, said, can you let us know how many countries you're listening to now? So uh, I haven't looked this up. I only have to pull it up now. So this is just for Spotify alone. We are currently on... Hang on, that's... That's need, only for one episode, That's only it? for one episode. I need to get it overall. Sorry about this. Just give us a second there. Tech issues. Yeah. Uh, we should grand. have been more prepared here. But sure, look. It is what it is. We've run with it, Brian. That's it. <laughs> Do you want to take a guess? What, how many countries? Yeah. No. I have it here. Right, 53 countries now. That's good. That's unreal. That's late. That is unreal. I'm going to just call out some obscure ones. So, Lichtenstein. I'd imagine Dylan Moore. Lichtenstein. <laughs> Dylan Moore, <laughs> mate, over there. Yeah. <laughs> <Lisbon. laughs> uh, Chile. There's no way these can understand us. There's not a nah, hope that nah. they can understand what we're saying. Lebanon, so that's probably the boys. They must just like the, 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 like the, the accent. <laughs> Shout out Jordan O'Kearney, Sean Gannon. The, the boys, boys legend. Guitar. Argentina. Paul Duffy as well. Israel. Um, South Africa. Oh, Estonia. A quick fact. We Bruni. 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 What's Bruni? Bruni. 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 Yeah, Bruni. Yeah. Yeah. Never that? heard of that country. I, I think it's fair, far east. Uh, someone Ardus. sent us Middle a East, couple of screenshots there about a month or two ago, and we were the number one podcast in a country called Bahrain. Yeah. Bar, where's I think, Bar Rain? I think it's over beside Bruno. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's beside the close. UAE. It's, beside, <laughs> it's close yeah, to I think they're all in and around that. We were the, the number Emirates. one podcast in that country but, when we were number one in Ireland. That's yeah, nice. but more than, but uh, we've been number one there more than we've been number yeah. one in Ireland. We were number one there like a few times. Yeah. Bar Rain. Bar Rain. Yeah, just go show the power of podcasts, isn't it? it? Just it's reaches, nuts, the audience is going to reach. But like, there's a lot here from uh, South America, a couple of African countries here. The US, obviously, look, we have a big contingency in Australia, uh, New Zealand, the UK, Canada, all that. Then the UAE, just, but these are all Irish people around yeah. the world, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but I couldn't believe some of them, like Singapore, <laughs> Indonesia, uh, Taiwan, <laughs> Philippines, and then you're like Denmark, Italy, Finland. I'm not really surprised with that. Hong Kong, China, uh, Vietnam. That's Honestly, lads, like, there's 53 that. countries there. Yeah, that is mad. Yeah. Great, that. It's brilliant. Isn't brilliant, it? You yeah. know what I mean? Like, oh, and getting, getting the, me- the message is really important as well. Getting that message out as well. The words that you just get out. Just the honesty of it all. Mm. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, it's that's brilliant. What we deal, Brian. That's what we say all the time. I mean, we said it in an interview yeah. the other day. We're off the ball. Like, that's, we just be, be real, be honest. Yeah. We're vulnerable doing it, but we just do it. it Somebody works. reached out to me as well. Well, not me personally, but us. And they said, uh, have you got any advice for starting a podcast? And I said, just be as honest as you can. And I know, Brian, you said this before, because uh, you, you're going to be creating a podcast, if you don't mind yeah, saying Yeah, 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 sure, well, yeah. And Next the reason why you're creating the podcast is because you've dealt with media before, but 
Yeah, well, it's, it's just getting that word out, getting that word out, just wanting to show people that change is possible. That's really the thing for me. But I think the authenticity piece is really key, just talking about the truth of, of people's stories. But it's getting people's stories out there. Cause I remember hearing something a while ago that, that, that somebody said and it stuck me. People don't remember what you say. They remember how you make them feel. And I think it's authentic stories. Because when someone's telling you something, and you know it's from the heart and they're really speaking their truth and there's vulnerability there. It just hits home. There's an energy. There's a connection in that as mm. well. And that's, what, that's what, I, what it's all about for me, mm. you know? I mean, that's the thing. And with podcasts is you're not, you're not constricted. You're not like, right, you have to talk about this and then we're going to move on to that and then we're going to have an ad break. But you can't mention this part and you can't yeah. be caution. Whereas we're a podcast, it's two, well, three fellas here, yeah. three microphones and off his go. Open yeah. discussion, see how it goes, see yeah. what comes out. And yeah. that's it. And there's yeah. no restrictions then. And that's, and that's why th we don't script anything yeah. either because yeah. like, like, sh like sh people do say to me in a nice way, like, we're just not just going like, with like the facts and a few things here and there, which makes sense to an extent. Yeah. But we're like, we'd rather just go in there and miss something and go, ah, oh, bollocks, I should have said that, but be real with it and yeah. be honest and just ask questions that pop into your head while someone is speaking. I would just much prefer that. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's open forum, isn't it? And it's that's the difference. Like, I was doing a radio show for a while and it's the reason, the real reason why I want to do a podcast as well. So we can just say what you want to say. None of that scripted stuff because yeah. if you only have a certain amount of time and, and it's, it's I think that's why podcasts are so different than radio and television as well all of a sudden the script isn't there it's just free flowing and honestly just comes out not all of the time but most of the time most it gives the time, that opportunity yeah. you know? so that's the voice that we have to offer so stay authentic to yourself yeah. no matter what your subject matter is whether it be sports films fashion just stay true to yourself and your content will speak for itself then yeah. Yeah. and just it's easy to get caught up and like I said to you just before it's like the things that we have going on now are huge, like, but like, we just don't dwell on anything at all. Like, yeah. We just keep running with everything and we're we, we will never get caught up. Like, we'll always just stay real and stay true to ourselves because that's what you have to do, mm, you know what yeah. I mean? So I think that's what that's, got us to where we are. Yeah, so yeah. we'll just stick with that, just keep going with that mm. and see what happens. Yeah, yeah. Right, uh, you want to move on to the... It's becoming a weekly segment now. Relationship yeah, advice. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was that a certain topic? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Ryan, you don't know why you had to get yourself into here. Wow. <laughs> so uh, this week's question was: Is it okay for your friends to still be? Or to, is it okay for your friends to remain friends with your ex? Yeah, and yeah, under certain circumstances. So if you. If I was with someone yep. and I finished with them yep. and we just finished on a mutual basis or we finished because something happened but nothing too major, obviously I'd expect to still be friends. I wouldn't be like, don't talk to that person. But if we finished because this person done the door on me, cheated on me or did yeah. something along them lines or did something really, really bad, then I'd be like, I, I would prefer my friends not to talk to them. But again, you don't have that choice. But if the option was there... I'd say, of course you can still be friends with someone's yeah. ex. Of course you can. Because I was thinking about this as well. I was thinking, like, imagine if I finished with my board and, like, she'd be friends with my friends. I might, I might say to my mate, saying, like, you can't talk to her or your boards can't talk to her. And I'd be like... Stupid. That's very immature. But if she did the door on you... That's a different story. Oh, to ah, everything is cut off. Yeah. That's it now. Yeah, and I'm with you on that. I'm with you on that. And a good friend should know that. It should be, it should be just... It, it shouldn't yeah. even have to be said, you I'm know what I mean? Exactly. There should be no discussion in there. It just shouldn't have to be said. Shared values, I think that's important as well, yeah, like yeah. trust and all that kind of stuff. Here we are now. Relationship advice. From <laughs> relationship <laughs> advice from the talking bollocks fellas yeah. and Brian Penny. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, look, that's the ugly hand done for the week. That's the zingers boxed off. That's the question done. Who the fuck is Mickey Evans? <laughs> 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 uh, Brian, we're just going to jump straight into you this week. Jock's off straight in, isn't it? So, Let's uh, go. What's your name? Where'd you come like from? Brian Day Silla Black. Brian, so what's <laughs> my name? Brian Penny is my name. Where do I come from? I come from a lot of places, lads. I really do. Originally born in Fingless. Um, was it? I was born in Fingless. Yeah, I was born in Fingless. Uh, are you sure? Uh, well, I'm sure. Just about, just about. We stayed there for a couple of years. Moved over to Canada for a year. Got kicked out of Canada. The poor police escort home on the plane. Baba. I was only five. I won't go into the details. Uh, but I don't, I, don't, I don't even know yeah, all the details. Man, I don't like even you. know all the details. I played the fifth. But uh, what you call it? Came back. Ballymun Flats. Because we, 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 the family, we, we, we left. We sold a house. And um, I, was, I was only a kid. And then we sold a house. Doing all right, went over to Canada to start a new life. Originally to Australia, but they stopped. Dublin was in a big, Ireland was in a big recession at the time, so we we're going to have to start a new life. 
didn't work out, got kicked back, ended up in the Ballymun Flats without any furniture or anything like that. My only memory of the Ballymun Flats, I'll never forget it, is just lying on the on the floor with my face to the ground because you have me mad was always raves about the Ballymun Flats because they'd heated uh, heated floors. Yeah, and I remember having me fl- heat floor. It was just it was nice to be home. I can't remember like hating Canada or having that. Like, I was only five six years of age, but I was obviously homesick because I remember feeling the Ballymun back in Ireland, nice to be home, f- uh, face to the to the toilet floor. But um, then from Ballymun there for a year, and then when I was seven, I moved to a place called Ladieswell out in Blanchardstown. Great community, spirit, great people, but it was a problematic area, and that sort of started a, started a life of uh, madness for me. Well, in, f- in fairness, so th- w- w- will, I, will I jump into the story of well, yeah. where it is? When yeah. are we talking about? 80s? 80s, yeah. So I was born in 78. Um, born in 78, 85, we came back from Canada. So I think moved, moved to Ballymun, 85, ladies well, then was yeah. 85, and lived there pretty much all my life up until up until I got kicked down. You got. So, <laughs> yeah, so you obviously went to school out in Blanchard, did you? Went to school out in Blanchard town, yeah. And what yeah. was school like? Skill was grand. Skill was grand. I liked skill. I enjoyed skill. I was. Uh, I wouldn't say uh, it's not nice to call yourself clever, but I wasn't stupid in skill. You know what I mean? I liked. I enjoyed. Um, I enjoyed skill. I enjoyed maths. I enjoyed English and stuff like that. So I, I enjoyed it. I'm mad, mad for football. I was like obsessed with football. Played football all my life, and I enjoyed it. PE, all the different things, and uh, yeah, loved, loved living in ladies. Well, like part of my backstory is around addiction and anxiety and stuff like that. I always say that I was riddled with anxiety as a kid just afraid of the world afraid of everything but within all of that I loved football and I loved growing up as well it was great elements to it as well of growing up and I just thought I, I, I had big plans for myself growing up I'm going to do this I'm going to do that but then the world the world had a different path for me you know mm. Right you mentioned uh, all the madness that then out in ladies well out in Blanche or wherever fill us in what happened there yeah, it was it was just the early. So what happened in Ladieswell? The early, as I said, great community spirit, great people, some great friends. I still have amazing friends out there as well. But Ladieswell was like a little estate out would in Blanchard. Would that only been kind of starting off when you was moved in? Would you yeah. have been like a four set? Of we people were the four set of people yeah. that lived there, and he basically created two hundred houses. That's what Ladieswell is. It's Drum Heat. Actually, Ladieswell is a big place now. At the time, it was Drum Heat. It was two hundred houses out in the sticks back then. Yeah. It was out in yeah. the sticks. <laughs> And he basically moved everyone that out from Ballymoon, Darndale, and they all moved them into this area with no amenities, no school, no community centre, nothing like that. It was a recipe melting pot. for a melting pot, a yeah. recipe for disaster. And I remember they tried to have this community spirit and all this. They tried to create this community spirit. But some of my first memories is watching my dad. Like I was only seven years of age, and my dad going out to be a vigilante, fighting with people in Cardiff, young fellas in Cardiff that were coming over to Ladeswell. They were the two estates, and they were my first memories growing up. And then. As I got older, like the, the, some of the older young fellas in the state, like there was no amenities, there was nothing to do. So yeah. what are young fellas are going to be young fellas? So they were out drinking, they were out eh, doing whatever young fellas do, you know what I mean? There was just, and my memories growing up is just rob cars every single night and it just escalated, drugs, violence, all of these different kinds of things. And then as a young fella growing up in that, you want to be a part of that, you listen to rap music, you think it's cool. And I'll be honest, I, it was never in me to be like the gangster type, whatever that even is, you know what I mean? But I used to aspire to be that. And even though I got into drugs and I was selling drugs and all that, it was never it was never in me blood to be able well, to... What you, what's really happening there is you're just becoming a product of your environment, really. That's it, that's it, you know? yeah. And yeah. So talk to us then, so as you're getting older, you're getting into your teenagers, what's... Yeah, and as, as I mentioned at the start, so the, so the first thing that I, that, that I didn't really touch on, right? So I, ca- I came into this world, right, with a, with a condition known as intestinal malrotation. And, and they often say, like, human beings are flawed. But I came into this world very much flawed, physically flawed. And I had a big operation. It was in 1978, right? It was only in 1985 that the medical practice, like, of the world realized that infants experience pain like normal adults, right? So before that, infants had operations without a general anesthetic. So I literally went under the knife without a general anaesthetic and since me studies in psychology and learning all these different things we re- we don't, I, didn't re- I don't remember that operation but even talking about this now I want to rub that scar on my stomach it's still in my body it's, it's like a trauma it's it. implanted yeah. that goes into your body it's like trauma a bodily yeah. trauma you know and I think that set the tone for me to be anxious, to be uh, to be fearful of the world. I was compulsively thinking. My mum and dad, great parents, but it was a drinking family. And all of my memories are waiting up for my mum and dad to come home drinking, all of these different alcohol-related related issues. And that's what my life was. And then 
although I had good times playing football and stuff like that, I was just always tormented by my mind. So I start, I was mad into football. I remember getting an injury. I was about 12 years of age, tour, no, tour, about 13 years of age, and I got an injury, a bad knee injury, and I couldn't play football for a while. And I remember all of my mates, they were smoking cigarettes, they were starting to smoke hash, and I thought they were all stupid. I was like, I'll tell you I'm as. Like, not not because I was a rat or anything like that. It was more like, you're stupid. Don't mm. be smoking. Don't be throwing your lives away. And that was the mindset I had. But when I wasn't playing football for a while, I remember we were up in the Gammers, the football dressing rooms, and I remember my mate Alan turns around and says, I had deadly head buzz off this. It was a big Samson roll-up tobacco cigarette you had. Mm. It says, a head buzz. I says, give us a little puff of that. And says, in my head, I'm never going to smoke, but I was getting curious about drugs yeah. and head buzzes and all. And I took a little puff of that. And honestly, I, I honestly believe from that moment, that was my, my first ever head buzz. And it just gave me this little spark. Oh, I like this. I like this rush, this little head buzz thing. And it escalated very quickly for me. I was smoking cigarettes, smoking hash. My older brother was smoking hash, so I quickly started smoking hash taking tablets, down petrol, down the fields. It just escalated very, very, very quickly. And what I was doing was I was medicating myself. I was taking myself away from that anxiety and that pain. And the reason why I talk about that little story at the start with not getting not getting the, uh, the, the, anesthetic. the anesthetic for the operation was I always wanted it. Like I was, I, I was very curious about drugs and I wanted to try everything. And I says, right, we're going to try heroin just once. So this great idea. We'll do heroin, but we'll just do it once. And I remember my first night down heroin. I wrote in the book, I have a whole chapter dedicated to my first night down heroin. I have it called Fallen in Love. And it was just like a warm blanket was just wrapped around my soul. And it just took me away from that pain. And I remember just saying, oh my God, I have found what I've been looking for mm. my entire life. And, I I don't, I don't, I think I used to think everyone was sort of anxious. I never talked about it because I was like that that you Well, it definitely like, didn't back in your day. Yeah, back and in we're my still day, struggling to do it today. Yeah. And that's this what this is it. But I wouldn't even tell me mad at that. I felt bad. I don't even know if I if I thought I felt differently. But I didn't. I I I, I wouldn't have talking about it anyway because I was like from ladies. Well, I'm hard. I don't deal yeah. with feelings. You know all that kind of crap. But when I got that drug, it was like game over for me. Then I loved this, and that that was the start of the end. Really. What age are we talking here? I was seven then. When you first did heroin? When I was first done heroin. I was 16 doing methadone for some strange reason. We done methadone, methadone. first. Yeah, done methadone first, not realising it was a, a heroin substitute. Yeah. Although my mate that I since done it with, he says, he's fucking, we fucking damn well knew it was a heroin substitute. <laughs> so I have a different warped warf memory of that. Yeah. But we said we do heroin once and we done it at 17 and that was a game changer for me. So... When you're talking about smoking hash, taking tablets, petrol, all this, what age are we talking? That was 14 to 17. That was so that, starting at 14. Starting at 14, maybe 14, maybe 14. It's hard to remember. I was trying to go back when I was writing the book, I was trying to remember. I'd say around 14 would have, would have been for, for all so the start. Early, like, anyways. Early, early, yeah. Young, like, yeah, yeah, life, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? So, you believe you're obviously taking these as a coping mechanism for anxiety and yeah. childhood trauma. Really. See that way, you, the way you describe taking heroin, it's mad because, like, we said that when we had Chrissy Dignam on the podcast, we said that to him as well. It's like it's romanticised when you see yeah. like rock and roll in the 60s, 70s and the 80s. Mm. And uh, you know that song, Golden Brown? Text are like sun. Text are like sun, yeah. Like that's it. And that's yeah. exactly how we are. And it's like romanticised then. Yeah. But that's on a high level. You think, oh yeah, heroin, that's yeah. something what rock stars do. But then like it, what it sounds to people on the street. But well, there obviously is something in it yeah. that takes... The numbness is there. Yeah. It just takes it all away then. And it's like it's like a spiritual, like it's it's I, I've started to gone on I don't like the word spiritual, but I've started to gone on a journey, but there's something like feels spiritual artificial spirituality. That's what it's like when you're doing it. And and that romanticized piece is, is crucial. Like we were mad into Jim Morrison. Jim Morrison said try everything once. For years I blamed yeah. Jim Morrison and the fact there was an addict said so that's Jim Morrison's fault. We all tried it because we were mad into him. He said try everything at least once. So we done it once. Now, a few of the lads that were with us that tried it once, they didn't get strung out. But that's the thing. Did. Like, that's so risky. That's what we yeah. talked yeah. about as well. Like, it's like, oh, like, if, you, if you're sober, say you're sober from alcohol yeah. addiction and you were an alcoholic and you're sober and you're two or three years sober, it's not like as if you can just go and, oh, I'll just try a glass of wine because if you enjoy it, you can just easily fall back into yeah. it. But some people can just take that one glass and be grand about yeah. it. Other people can have that one glass, get the taste again, get the itch, and it's straight back down that road. Yeah. So that's where this whole business of trying things once, I don't really agree with that, you know? No, but it's legal. It's yeah. legal. Yeah. 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 So you're 17 then, trying heroin for the first time. Yeah. What's life like then after that? What's life like then after that? Now, I, I still thought, like, I was I was a talented footballer. I was never going to make it, but I was good at football. Yeah. If I continued playing football, I probably would have played at a decent level. Wouldn't have been in England or anything like that, but I would have played at a decent level. 
but when that was sort of ending for me, I said, I still had high hopes. I was fairly good in school. I says, right, I'm going to have a good career. Great self-belief of where I was going to go. So you were on the path to finishing school there still? Ah, yeah, yeah. I don't me leaving cert. Yeah. I don't me leaving cert. I was doing gear while I was doing me leaving cert. Madness when I think of it. Don't me leaving cert. Went to uh, college. Went to an art college because I wanted to go to art college. I only done six months there. I remember my dad had a coal run and he says, do you want to take over the coal run? Now, we were selling hash at this stage. Me and my mate were selling hash on the coal run. We used to go to the people in the estate he says, yeah, what's this for hash and this for coal? Same customers, like, you know what I mean? We ate, I think it was 18 at that time. But I was just enjoying life. And then I got a job then working um, when I was 18. I, I was in art college. And the college that I was in, the job that I was in for 17 years, so I was a functional addict. That's a real important part of the story. So what you call the job I was in, I was in for 18 years, rang the college and they said, have you anyone that might fit the job? And they says, here, right. We have a couple of names. So I went in for an interview, didn't know what it was about. They liked me personality because I had no skills for the job. They liked me personality, took me on. And then, yeah, life was good there. I was drinking. The, the heroin thing, I always says, right, I'll never be an addict. I, that was my whole thing. I'll never be an addict. So I used to do heroin. I started off once every month, then once every two weeks. And that started to continue from the age of around 17 to 19. And it was becoming a once a week thing. It was really creeping in. Yeah. And then I had a panic attack. When I was, I think it was around 20, when I had my first panic attack. Now, I already struggled with anxiety. But after that panic attack, and I was taking coke and all of the uppers, then going party and all these different kinds of things. Um, and I, I, I used to blame. I remember drinking a can of Red Bull. I says, Red Bull made me have that panic attack. Just <laughs> completely forgot about all the speed and coke. Don't, you know what I mean? That's grand, because I don't want to put a damper on that, because yeah. I want to do that again. I won't drink Red Bull anymore. I haven't drank Red Bull since, actually. <laughs> I don't plenty of coke after it, though. But that panic attack just... Uh, after the panic attack ended, it was like anxiety was down here. And I, it, when I came back, it was at another level. And I couldn't live with that anymore. I was working, I was working in the job, and I'd gotten into a good bit of debt. I got credit cards at that stage. I was only 19. I built up these debts pretty quick, paying for drugs and all this kind of thing. And I remember uh, thinking, right, I can't walk. I couldn't hold a mouse. I was working do, on a computer in a, in a graphics company, to, for a printing company down the graphics. And I literally couldn't do my job. And I remember going to the doctor and saying, I think I had a stroke. That's what I said. I thought I had a stroke or something was seriously wrong with me. He says, you have anxiety. It's generalized anxiety disorder. He says, I says, what? Well, didn't even know what it was back then, you know? And I says, nah, it's something serious, something more serious than that. But he gave me a couple of benzos. And um, he gave me them and he really sorted the anxiety. You know, I says, yeah, he's maybe he's right. But I was still messing around with the gear as well at that stage. And I remember just doing the gear with the benzos and saying, I go lovely together, like the, the buzz of that together as well. And I was getting, I was starting to do gear, I'd say that stage, probably twice a week. I was, it was screaming at me to do it more because that's what I wanted to do. But to me, I'm not a real addict, wasn't going to let me go down that direction. And I remember going back to the doctor, give me a week's supply of benzos, uh, Valium. And I went back to the doctor and I says, I need more volume for me anxiety disorder, whatever the hell that is. I says, oh, that's not a, that's not a long term fix. That's only short term. Here's a book. You're going to have to go out and get sorted out. There's a book. And I remember freaking out with the doctor, just snapping, saying, I need drugs. I can't walk. I can't, I can't operate like this. I'm in serious trouble here. And he says, look, you're going to have to work on yourself. And I remember walking out of uh, the doctor's office, blaming the doctor, saying, well, that's it. I have to be a heroin addict because I knew heroin got rid of mm -hmm. anxiety. And I started doing heroin on a, on a daily basis and pretty soon after that, and it just really escalated. But in saying that, I was a very functional addict. I was, I'd say very functional. I was a functional addict for a long, long time. For another 10 years, it was only really when I hit 30 that it all started getting out of control. Wait, that's ser seriously long time. Mm. Yeah, it sure so is. Like 17 to 30. Like yeah. Fucking. yeah. But, so, you're saying you were a functional addict, so, boy, that you mean, you were walking then. I held down a job and, and it turns out like I've done a lot of research around this as well. I've worked with people in addiction and lo lots of people are functional addicts, like even her heroin addiction. People think they're heroin addicts. They have this stereotypical version that they see from train spotting or, yeah. or the films and the news and stuff like that. Mm. It's not. If you go to America and you think of the opioid crisis, oh, yeah. it's mostly medical heroin, like, you know what yeah. I mean? Oxy, Oxycontin and all this kind of stuff. So I was, I, now I was buying street heroin, but I was getting me methadone. I was on a methadone clinic. I was going, doing urines, giving, that, giving me urine once a week, getting me methadone. Down, but everyone that does methadone, I don't, I don't know anyone that's ever done methadone and didn't do other drugs. Most of them still do heroin. The methadone sort of takes the edge off the heroin. You don't get as good a buzz, but it's still just taking everything you can to numb the pain. So that's all I was literally doing. But it was like a snake trying to eat its own tail. Like I was constantly running away from the drugs, but the, or running away from the anxiety with using drugs. But the drugs were making it worse, and yeah. tolerance 
all that kind of stuff the tolerance was building up I needed to take more drugs I wasn't getting anything out of anything anymore and I was just doing more and more and more and more and more and I was gonna come to a head at some stage you know mode, yeah self-destruct really? mode yeah but yeah what was the how you summed up methadone before we were having a chat before this yeah. and you said something really really powerful yeah, about methadone yeah one of my best mates and God bless him he's still, he's still deep deep in it and uh, he said to me one day he says because methadone is known as a maintenance drug and he says, you know what, Penny? Yeah, that was me, Nick. That was me, Nick. Then so he called, you know what, Penny? Says, methadone doesn't maintain you; it contains you. And I remember just thinking, that is absolutely exactly what it does, because it takes away your your life force. It takes away your soul. It really does. So I'm not saying if I never got access to methadone and the amount of methadone, like I needed it at the time. But it's given out so freely, but because it just contains people. Because instead of having people mad for gear or mad for whatever and going out running the muck, robbing and all that stuff, fill you full of methadone and you've no energy to do anything. But you've mm. no energy to to go out and and you've no motivation. It just kills your motivation, your life force. But then you've no you've no motivation to get clean either. It just sort of puts you in a box and keeps you there for a long time. And no wonder there's so many long term methadone addicts, yeah. you know. And you think it's just kind of kicking the can down the road, really. It's yeah. not really addressing the problem. Yeah, it's not addressing the problem at all. Because we've been critical about this before, about yeah. how methadone, well, foy, as most people foy, would yeah. know it. Like it and yeah. you see people on foy and like how it physically affects people and it's it's horrible as well. And, and and don't get me wrong, right? What you call it? Um, there there is elements. When when I first got clean, I thought it was all about fellowship. It's complete absence. This is what you have to do. There's some people out there that have been through so much turmoil in their life, through so much trauma, that they probably do need some kind of something to take the edge off for the rest of their lives. It's about harm reduction. Maybe they do need a bit of methadone, maybe they do need a bit of medication, whatever that is, off doctors or whatever. But if you can get abstinent and get completely clean, for me, it was getting off methadone. Like I, I, got, I, got, off the, I got off the benzos. They were the worst thing to get off. But I got off everything. But coming off the methadone was absolutely rough. And when I finally got off the methadone, it was like something was awoken inside of me and it just spurred me on to have... To to, to, to have this energy and zest for life and it, it was a huge problem for me and I would say it to anybody like if, you, if, you, if you're if you on methadone and you're just hanging in on methadone you think you can get off it try to, try to get off it because I do think it just holds you back you know mm. yeah it's sad that because I was only saying to Calvin yesterday that I was going through town with my brother there recently a couple of weeks ago and I was going up a lane in in town there and a fella come up to me he was only at the taking his methadone when he was and yeah. he come up to me and he knew who I was and he was talking he was saying that he's only had to get now the joy yeah. he's had to do it a few years and he, he had a conversation with me and he was saying to me uh, that he's stuck on the methadone he's like oh, I love what you're doing he said my nephew's put me on to you I love what you're doing it's unbelievable and all and he was like look I'm caught up in this game I, 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 I'm taking me methadone I'm taking me girl he said and we just had a good chat and he, was, he ended up saying to me like I don't think I'll live much longer because I can't really live without this and I have to keep taking it and yeah. I had a lump in my throat that was like that's how bad it is and yeah. that's these are normal people like I'd, I'd sit down with most people like if I'm out and about and I'm not busy I'll usually go in and grab someone a coffee it was outside happening you know they're on her yeah. or something like that I'll sit down and have a chat with them because they really are normal people mm. but when this bloke came up to me I had a real like I, I couldn't even get over it I felt so bad for him because he's like I'm just caught up I don't think I'm going to live much longer and all I need this and all and I just think that that's madness and he, he said to me then or if it's get someone on that that was on heroin and he was recovered from it and all, I think it might help someone out there. I don't think it'll help me, he said, but it might help someone out there and I'd love you to do that and all. And I just thought it was unbelievable. Like, yeah, and you know what? That's pulls at the heartstrings as well. It just brought me right back when I was when I was on methadone. I was on eighty mils, ninety mils, and mm. you you like you you're, you're going to the clinic every week. You're collecting your methadone every day. If you're giving dirty urine, you're drinking it in front of the chemist every day, in front of the pharmacist. And you yeah, have great plans because everyone, no one wants to be on drugs. No one wants to be on her mm. methadone, wants to be on heroin when you're on it because like people think addicts are getting stoned all the time. Once you're a few years in that, you're not getting stoned anymore. It's all about bringing you back up to some kind of baseline normality so you don't feel like shit. It's about not feeling like shit. It's not mm. about getting stoned anymore. I mean, you see addicts on the streets that look stoned. They're not. They're actually in withdrawal. They're just in really in struggling. People, in don't people don't realise. People don't realise that. And that's why we're trying to change this perception of like when you see someone on the street, people, the first thing people might say is, Oh, look at that junkie yeah like that's a person that, that's a person that's With suffering a family yeah and yeah. they're suffering yeah and we need to help these people they're not a statistic that's a person 
and and this is this is the thing, man. It really is. This is the the big thing, right? It's like when when you're in that. So that just that story just brought me right back. And you have this motivation, right? I'm gonna get off this methadone. And you say, right, you go into your doctor. He brings you down five meals a week because you have to wean you off slow. You get to eighty five. You get to eighty. You get to seventy five. Then something happens, and you're in that mindset anyway, and you just jump back into it. It's literally nearly impossible. And then what you what you mentioned there, like that's the key thing. It's like. People that want to be on the drugs, nearly every person in addiction is using it as an anesthetic exactly, for trauma, yeah. for anxiety, yeah. for depression, for their environment that they were brought up in. Like even the environment, like we talk about where, where we all grew up and, and there's great elements to that as well. But there's a lot of violence going on, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on and your body doesn't, isn't able to cope with that. Like you're constantly like, I, I, I teach, I study the neuro, neuroscience of all this stuff now as well. Your body is constantly on red alert, cortisol, anxiety, anxiety is like a tap when you live in an area like that and it constantly has you on red alert and you're 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 always looking for something to to help you to medicate how you feel because the body is always trying to get back into homeostasis you call it back into equilibrium and the brain is sort of looking for tricky ways that's what they talk about the angel and the devil on your shoulder the de or the devil more so on your shoulder trying to trick you into doing this and that but it's only trying to get you to feel better about yourself so you don't feel crap because it thinks you're you're dying inside all the time that's how it how it, how it sort of communicates mm. uh, with that it's stuff. all just a cult and making Really it's at the all end of the a coping mechanism, and that's yeah. why, like, that's why on this when we had Limbo one on the podcast, we were talking about the getting the heroin centres in because, like you just said there a minute ago, nobody wakes up and chooses to try heroin. No. Mm -hmm. Look, if if we get these heroin centres in for people to go and use, it's less needles on the streets. Yeah, it, it's people a safe place where people can go and use. No, Brandon. Yeah, it's, it's not more like people it's if, recovering. It's not me. I'm not going to wake up tomorrow stressed and go fuck that I'm doing heroin. That's not where it comes from. Like, look at it. This it's childhood it. trauma. It's yeah. it's so much shit like some people really just have so much shit going on like we think we have a bad look you know what I mean and then if you really want to look into someone's head some people have it so bad and they just seen no other way than to try heroin but they didn't just wake up and choose that because there's, if we were to go to a heroin centre in yeah. that they, they're not going to see the heroin centre and go I'm stressed today I'm going to try heroin yeah. that's yeah. not how it works no. so it's years and years of trauma and stuff like that you and know? but the thing about them heroin centres is we're taking people who are doing heroin, heroin on the street we're taking them into these centres but what will happen eventually is we'll be taking more and more people off heroin yeah. because we're putting these facilities and services in place then to give mm. them counselling to give them a safe space to do this stuff yeah. so that medically they're going to be looked after and then I think mentally they're going to be looked after and that's yeah. the thing and like you were saying there's so much trauma in these people's heads that stems from somewhere and we see it like we, everyone has an auntie or an uncle who's addicted to heroin yeah. or a family member it directly affects you and we have these scars in our communities and as you said they're not easy places to grow up in because we're constantly on red alert but this stuff, it, it is generational, like, yeah. you know, like, our man that has grew up in the middle of the heroin epidemic when it was only introduced to Did the Did you ever streets. hear a man talking, or your dad talking about their friends? Me, And every honestly. time they have a conversation about years ago, they're like, ah, he's dead now, he's dead he, now, yeah. he's dead now, you're like... All oh. the time, all the time, like, anytime I'm with me dad, and we're going, he'd be like, see him, that's Brian, yeah, me and Brian used to hang around, and Brian's brother, yeah, oh, but he died of the girl years ago, and you're yeah. like... That's nuts. Do you know how much shit that they had to go through in terms of that, that heroin epidemic? Like, like, like if my mom's telling me a story about years ago, about the mad days, and she'd be telling me a story, she'd be like, yeah, now, but him, him and her are dead. I'm like, what? From heroin? Like, that's yeah. madness. Mm. Like, it's so scary to think about. And it's yeah. not even that. Imagine the effect that's having on your mom then. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, do you know what you I know, mean? You like, know, like, this is, and people need to realise this <clears> then, there's some people who are, on the street as a result of that and they're the aftermath of this yeah. you know because not everybody can say oh I grew up with them three people but they all died and like I just got on with my life some people are like trying to cope and cover that loss and the suffering that they have and they're trying to heal but how do they heal well some people find it through heroin or other drugs and now we have people looking at them and being like oh they're a lost cause they're not a lost cause nah. that's somebody's sister that's somebody's auntie that's somebody's mother you know, yeah. we can help these people. And and the healing that goes into that as well. Like there's there's lovely line in addiction circles that I love that addiction isn't a family or addiction isn't a spectator sport. Eventually the whole family get to play because it affects everybody. Yeah. Once someone goes into addiction, the whole family get affected. Yeah. But the one thing is that recovery gives people as well. The whole family are affected in a good way for recovery as well. Mm. So like no one is ever a lost cause, like ever, ever a lost cause. If I no, I was a I was a lost cause. Like I showed you the pictures of what I looked like. Oh, That's two years before. 
man. Jesus. It's not the same person. It's not the same scary. person. And it was like, what you call it, my sister was planning to how they're going to bury me and all this kinds of thing. And then when I went into detox, when I when I, I done a home detox, because you wouldn't let, I had to wait eight weeks to get into a benzo detox, to be able to get off benzos, to get into a heroin detox. And this is when I had, the only time I ever even thought about getting clean. And I had a seizure, what you call it, opened the gaff, beat me tongue down the centre. That was the start of me, started getting clean, beat me tongue, blood splurting down my mouth. My brother thought I was dead, rang me da. They were all coming to the gaff expecting me to be in a body bag. And my sister, she remember, she said this on the radio show, I think. She says, oh, that's a good thing. My dad be hurt, but he'd be better off. So they all thought to be better off without me. But the, 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 me getting into recovery has had a very positive impact on the family then as well. So there's been a lot of healing in that as well. So it's not only like helping people in getting these addict back to the addiction, getting these heroin centers in, you're getting to help people at a real level, and then that's going to have a, a, a rippling effect outside the community as well to all their other loved ones as well, and it just shows people that it's possible recovery is possible. You and know? they're bringing relationships back together. Back together, together you know. Hatchets getting buried yeah, there, you know. Yeah, like, whereas yeah. before, as you said, your sister said that about you. But now we used probably have a great relationship great, yeah. as a whole. Yeah, as a the whole, whole family. We great, 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 great Christmases together now. Things we never had before, and it's all it's it's amazing now. Yeah. It really is. I, th I think we we I don't know if this man to say or not. He's probably agree. He's probably don't. But I think we're on the back stretch of all the heroin thing. I think we talked about this. I think eventually we are gonna like because. Back then, nobody really knew what it was. A lot of people did. A lot of people didn't know what it was. Like Christy Dignam told us that he was going to buy hash, and he was told it was some form of hash or something like that the first time hash he tried it. Yeah. And mm. like that's that's how oblivious people were to what this could do to you. But I think nowadays there is a stigma around heroin or trying heroin for the first time. And I think we have enough education and enough to look at to sort of go, you can't do that. You know where your life can end up by doing that. And I think there's a lot less people starting it for the first time. So I think, to be honest, we would be on the back stretch of it. But I think heroin centres are essential. I think these type of things need to be put in place mm. for these people. Yeah, I think we have a plan to eradicate it. Like, it's there. I think, like, mm. look, at this is the light at the end of the tunnel. Should we not head in that direction? <clears throat> but we are on the back stretch. But I think, as you were saying, like, there's less and less. But if we still have someone doing it, that's too much. One person is too many people mm. trying and heroin. Because like, people, people I went to school with, and yeah, I'm seeing them on the streets, and I'm like... Mm. Like, you had more potential in school than I did. And, yeah. and you know what? The heartbreaking part is you're looking and that, like, you're kind of saying to yourself, that could have been me. Like, why are you not where I am? Just look at it. You know, like that? Yeah. And you're thinking, it, it's weird because you're ashamed of yourself because you're hoping that. I remember I seen someone and I was walking through town with my daughter and he was begging and I was like, oh my God, that's so-and-so. And then I was like, please don't call me. Don't call me. Because I was saying to myself, how do I explain to my daughter that this fella sitting on the side of the street yeah. is a fella I know or how he knows me, you know, like that? Yeah. And I'm like, mm. it, it's, a, it's a hard one it's to, hard to, to deal with on me, yeah. you know, like that? And I'm thinking, like, I'm thinking of my daughter then and then I'm thinking about him and yeah. imagine what he's going through because there's no way he wants to be in the position he's in. No, nah. no, nah. it's mad. You know, yeah. and like, it's the same age as me. It's scary to think about. Like, it is still happening. It is less and less, but one person is too, too many, many to be yeah. still trying to, you know? So... Brian, just before, because you were saying to us, what age did you get, you got clean then? I got clean, uh, so so I think I was saying up till about 30, I sort of was functioning up until about 30. When I hit 30 at all, it started to go really downhill. I just needed more, the heroin just wasn't working anymore, so I was just doing anything, scientifically combining drugs just to get completely off my head so I couldn't fail anymore. So um, it was another few years, and I just went off the rails then the last few years. So I was 35 when I when I finally, I uh, when I when finally tried to get clean for the first so time you were about 18 years on heroin 18 years on gear yeah 15 years I'd say, chron I'd say chronically addicted I was like uh, doing heroin every day for about 15 years I was on the methadone program for 12 yeah. right. that is it's like, like I, I don't want to sound bad here but that's like nearly impressive <laughs> yeah honestly like how yeah. many people can say they were on heroin for 15 years how many like you know yeah, like, it's nuts it's, it's absolute madness or is. it's scary to think about like because if you but what it does show is that you were on it, you were heavy on it for that amount of years, and you're after turning your life around, and we'll get into all of that. Yeah. But like that, like that's that's all we want is for someone out there to sort of go, if he can do it, I can do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? But just going back to when you were on it, I flat out now. I seen something that you did on, on TG4, Tina G. Car, what's it called? TG yeah. Car. TG yeah. Car. TG Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry We'd about be lambasted, bro. TG Car. <laughs> yeah, but I seen the thing you did on that, and you told a story about when. Yeah, cars were on fire in the garden. Yeah. The only thing. Do you want to get into that? 
Yeah, so that was a crazy time. It was, um, I think, I think I was about 28, 29 at the time. And um, what happened, there was, there was an incident happened earlier on, earlier on. I think it could have been a month or two before, before the cars went up. But it could have been, I was involved in a lot of things at that stage. It could have been a lot, a lot of different things. But all of a sudden, I remember just waking up. And here's the funny thing, right? I never wake up. Even now today, I don't wake up for anything. And when I was on drugs, I never woke up. I was comatose all the time. But I remember just waking up out of my sleep. And I was still a little bit stoned I was with them gear that day. I was still a little bit stoned. I was like, I just woke up in my bed. And I remember just hearing this funny noise. I says, what's that? And I got this weird feeling in my stomach. It was a weird. And when I think back on that, I'm thinking, how did how did I get that? I should have been comatose. Like, it was weird. But I got this feeling in my stomach, like this, no, like in the, the feeling in your pit, your stomach, something's wrong. And I looked out the window and I could hear the crackling and the car was on fire in the garden. And I says, oh shit, what the fuck, what the fuck? So I look, I, I jumped out of bed and I says, here, here, get up, the car's on fire in the garden. So I went to, woke up my brothers, woke up my ma, ran to my ma's room, ran to my sister. My dad was away for the weekend, he was. And I ran up and says, here, the cars are on fire in the garden. So I went back out to look at the window and the two cars were on fire, my car, my ma's car. And... Um, Basically, I was getting them out of bed. I was saying, here, come on, come on, come on. We have to get out of the gaff. We have to get out of the gaff. And then by the time they got up, it was like it happened really quick that the fire had just caught on and the cars were blazing. And we were, we were when we were going down the, the stairs, I'd run down the stairs to check it out and I could see the, the flames. I could hear the, the noise. It was the noise that really hits home with me, not a crackling noise. Mm. And I think the windows were starting to crackle off in the heat. And I says, right, we can't get out the front. Let's go out the back. Let's go out the back. So I was screaming, come on, we have to get out of the gaff. We have to get out of the gaff. Because I'd seen cars burnt in fields and I'd seen pe- the engine sometimes exploding, the yeah. petrol going up we have to get out we have to get out so we ran down I remember the whole family creeping down the stairs just getting down and it, it, we had to pass the front door where the cars were born before we could get out the back so we all ran out to the back my ma was hysterical just screaming crying what the hell's going on and it was only once I got everyone out I says that's something to do with me it has to be something to do with me and uh, my mom said, did you ring the fire brigade? And I says, no, no, no. So my sister ran in. She, we, Our mobiles were upstairs. I always say, if I said it in the book, our mobiles were upstairs. Yeah, there was mobiles back then. I think we were in the flip phones or whatever like that. But we says, can't go back upstairs. Just ring from inside. And I remember my sister running back in, ringing the fire brigade. And they were actually on their way. I think a neighbor called... But I, I just remember shitting they saying, what you call it, come, come back in, like what you call the cars go blow. So we were out the back with walls out the back and we know with, with houses either side, like it was a terrace gaff. So we couldn't even find out what was going on. We were just listening to the fire um, crackling over the wall and we could see the, the glow in, in, in the house through the, through the, through the kitchen. And uh, finally the fire brigade came, put it out and all that. But it was just like a crazy experience. Just yeah. me ma crying, me ma screaming, crying. And I knew it was something to do with me, which it turned out to be in the end. So uh, that was just like, that was just when I, and the funny thing is like, I'd love to say I felt horrific about that and I was all worried about my family. But I remember all I could think about was I have two bags of gear upstairs. I don't have to go to work now. I'm going to go off and smoke this because I can't deal with this shit. This is my fault and I can't deal with this shit. And all I wanted to do, I remember thinking, right, I'll go over to the industrial estate. I'll say I'm going here. I was working out. The addict mindset, I'll do this, I'll do that. Little spoof here, little spoof there. Cover myself, look good, blah, blah, blah. I'd be able to ring into the job saying something. The, the cars, the, the gaff got burned down. That's a great excuse to be off for a day or two. That's where my mind was. And that's what I went off and done. But at the same time, I was just sort of killing them feelings. Like, I, did, I didn't feel for years as an addict. And it's no wonder I didn't feel. Because all I was trying to do was numb my feelings. Because of whatever happened to me as a kid, that anxiety. But I couldn't just numb anxiety. I was numbing every single feeling I had. So at that stage, like, people talk about people in addiction that they don't care. But it is a very self-obsessed thing. Because mm-hmm. all you care about is killing the pain that you have and I know there's some people in addiction that do do every care of other people but a lot of people it's about numbing the pain it's I need drugs now yeah, to stop me fix, feeling the next fix the that's next all that matters and, and people say oh, they're always lying they're this that and the other but I couldn't say here I need to go and get a fix I need to do that now because people say what the hell are you doing so you're forced into lying as well and that's where it was at for me that's what I'd done that day and I was I was happy out driving over to the industrial so estate to scary, do it. Look, that, yeah. it shows how powerful that drugs are, that your thought process during all this all madness going on here is the two bags of girls. Yeah. upstairs. Like, that is scary. Like, and yeah. it, that shows how much it has people gripped, you know? Yeah. Like, it's absolute madness. So, all that is going on through your life. You said then, you got sober then. What's the thought process getting sober then? Would yeah. you say that's the lowest? 
no, point. that wasn't that. No, that was far from the lowest. Um, what you call that was when I was twenty nine. I, I had to move out soon now after that. I couldn't bring any more crap. So, so there was, there was that. I say I didn't care about um, what you call it, any in that moment, and I didn't. But I knew I had to get out of my ma's house. I couldn't bring anything else onto my ma's house. So we moved out. In fairness, I didn't even do it. my ma got us a house because she got us to move out in the end. But I knew I didn't want to bring any anything to my ma's door anymore. But that would have been a very, very low point. And looking back, it was one of the lowest points, but I didn't feel that at the, at the time. You felt uh, no shame about it. I felt like no shame. Yeah, I just didn't. It's just, what you call it, it was just, it's just all merged into one. It's very hard to access the feelings around that. What I can access is when I was writing the book and I was talking to my mom, my sister about all these kinds of things and I, I, I brought up all, when I, when I was talking to them in the moment and I could see their pain that they felt in them moments and I just felt absolutely horrific listening to the pain that I caused them, you know, that way. But um, that that was rough. But me, me lowest moment in addiction would have been um, probably when I was around 24, 25, a few years after that. I remember I was really close to me nanny. And she wouldn't let anyone have a bad word against me. No, no one could ever say, ah, Brian's great. He looks brilliant. He says, you look brilliant. In that, even in that picture you're seeing earlier, yeah. you look brilliant. And she wouldn't let anyone talk bad of me. And um, my nanny died in 2013. It was a couple of months before I got clean and she passed away and I was, uh, we were all went to the funeral. And I remember trying to get me, they were asking me not to go to the funeral. I says, look, you're just gonna, I, I wasn't, my mum sort of blanked me at that stage and I shouldn't have been around. I says, look, just don't go to the funeral. I says, I have to go to my nanny's funeral. And I was limp and I had sort of an infection in my knee and I was just all over the place. And I sort of says, right, I'm not gonna get stoned out of my head today in respect for my nanny. But what I should have done was probably taking drugs because I would have been better because I was just dying sick at the at the funeral. Yeah. And people just thought I was, I was, I was just stoned out of my head and I could barely walk. And I remember at one stage we were asked, to carry the coffin and I said I'll help carry the coffin the grandkids carrying the coffin and I remember I was put up my shoulder and I nearly fell and my uncle had to take over and I was at my ma seeing it she says guess we'll get him out of here I can't deal with that today and I was drove away from the from the from the funeral I remember my sister saying you didn't even put up a fight and I think I was nearly at death star at that stage I was in a bad bad way and I remember that was my lowest point but again it was just like I was just beaten into submission I had nothing left to give you know that way and then it was a couple of months after that that um, I decided, right, I'm going to have to get clean. I, like, I'd, I'd lost everything. I'd lost my job. I'd no way of making money. I was in a serious amount of debt to drug dealers, money lenders, banks, everything, all of that. And I said, right, I'm going to have to try to get clean for once. And I said, right, I'm going to try to get into a detox. Went up to my clinic and he says, right, you have to get off the benzos first. You'll have to wait eight weeks to get into a benzo detox. And I says, I'll be dead in eight weeks. Was this the first time you thought about recovery? First time I ever thought about recovery. I didn't even know the word recovery. It was for me. I I need to, and I didn't, I says, I need to get in somewhere, get myself sorted, not do all the drugs, but I need to do some of them because I can't cope with anxiety. I need drugs. That was a story I told myself. I couldn't live in a world without some drugs to, as, as, a, as a crutch, as a way to cope. So I says, right, I'll get into a detox and just see what happens. So I, I, I think I was like a cornered rat. I'd know what our angle to go at. This is what I had to do or I was going to be dead. And um, I couldn't get into a detox facility. I would have had to wait eight weeks. And it says, look, I'm going to do a benzo detox at home. And then when the benzos around my system, get into a heroin detox. And I remember the guy, he's, he allows me to talk about it. His name is Austin. He was a clinic manager there. And he says, look, says, um, says oh, what was he said to me? I can't even remember now. The words have lost me. But he says, he was basically telling me, don't do a benzo detox. You'll have a seizure. That's what it was. And I was like, ah, as if I'll have a seizure, Ross. No special addict syndrome. As if I'll have a seizure. So two days into that detox, I, I call it, it wasn't only the most painful night of my life. It was the most important night of my life. And it's what I touched on earlier on. I had a full-blown grand mal convulsive seizure, bit into my tongue, split down the center of my tongue, blood everywhere. My brother, what you call it, rang me dad, I think Brian's dead, everyone called to the gaff, it was horrific, I've, I've snippets of that memory sort of just in my head, I start the book off with this story actually waking up on the floor, and um, I, um, yeah, the ambulance came, rushed to the hospital, and I remember them treating me in the hospital, I, I have memories how they treat me in the hospital, just another addict, it's no point in even helping him, because he's just going to be back on the drugs, but I was trying to do a detox at that stage, coming off all of that, and I remember what you call it, it, lying on the trolley in Blanchestown Hospital. And I was lying on the trolley and I was just like anxiety, like the opposite of when you take heroin or you take a drug and it gets rid of your anxiety. 
withdrawal is the opposite of that so anxiety was just ramped up to all kinds of levels on top of a seizure on top of biting me tongue and i just wanted to jump out my own skin i was on the trolley just needed to get away from myself i said how can i get away from this but i just nothing i was absolutely broken and i remember i started just pulling myself up off the trolley and i leaned my legs over the side of the trolley and me my hands just started land on, on on me on me face like that hanging off the trolley and my eyes just fixated on this red fire extinguisher on the wall and I was looking at it, like tunnel vision looking at this, and I was saying, what, what, what's that? I said, that's, that's red, that's it, that's a fire, that's a fire extinguisher, it's, what's the colour? And I couldn't piece the object together, I couldn't say what it was. And I remember getting a bit panicked looking around the room, trying to name objects, and it was like my verbal world didn't make sense anymore. I was saying, what the hell's going on? And I remember just waiting for this overwhelm, because anxiety still chased me all my life. I was always just tormented by my mind, and I was thinking, oh my God, you're brain damaged. Yeah, game over. Your fucking game over. That's brain damage. You're done now. And I was waiting for this overwhelm to come over me. But I remember just sitting, lying down on the trolley saying, I give up. You win. I can't fight this anymore. I'm done. And it was like this sense of peace came over me. And what retrospectively, I've looked back on that. And I believe that was the moment that transformed my life. I stopped fighting with reality. I stopped trying to fight with my own mind, trying to push back. And I just, it was acceptance in that. I can't do this on my own. That's one. I'm, I'm done. Can't do that. It was like a chink in the armor, just of some kind of acceptance, some kind of surrender, letting go of trying to control things. And... Right, a couple of weeks later, benzos out my system. I had another couple of seizures, another couple of hospital visits, but I'd no more fight left. I'd stopped fighting at that moment. Finally got into a heroin detox. It was up in a, up in a little farm up in Nall, done six weeks in there, got off methadone. And yeah, something, something. There was a huge shift, everything, but it started with that fire extinguisher incident, that, that moment of surrender. And do you have any inkling into what it was in that moment? What shit? Your mind to just go. Yeah, I, d I don't know. Yeah. So what what happened was right when I was on the farm up in there, I start reading about spiritual spiritual book awareness, self awareness, all these different things, mindfulness, all these psychological stuff. Mad into these books, and I just felt this energy coming back into me body. It was like, oh my god, I have a life again. I have a chance at a life again here. What what the hell's going on? And as, as I was coming towards withdrawal, special addict syndrome kicked in again, actually. It was like special addict, um, I don't think I'm going to get withdrawal. I think I was starting to think I was some kind of monk sage or something like that. Yeah. Not that mad kind of thinking. Mm. I don't think I'm even going to get withdrawal after methadone. But that kicked in hard. But it was on my first day of cleanse, the 8th of October 2013. And I remember waking up and I walked down uh, to the kitchen. I was the only one up. And it was just something different about the world. It was just beautiful. It was something just shining about the world and I walked out onto the farm and it was just absolutely beautiful the way I describe it was like my sensory experience like colours were brighter the boards were chirping it was just like singing into my ears it was like it was just this profound amazing experience now I think it started with the acceptance of the fire extinguisher incident but it was just this profound experience where I was just so in the moment. Now, that sent me off on a crazy journey. Like, I went and I studied psychology in Minute University. I done me, I'm just finished my PhD, well, done my thesis the last few years. And all of my study, lots, so much of it has been around this idea of the thinking mind and our emotions. So what I realized when I done a meditation in a treatment center a few weeks after the detox facility, we we're doing a med guided meditation and the, the teacher was like, thoughts will come in and thoughts will go out. And I had this realization, wow, my, my mind is really quiet. And then I was like, my mind used to be racing all the time. So I was, I was, I, I, I had this, this question, like, why did I suffer? Why don't I suffer anymore? And how can I help other people? And what, what I've realized, what, what I've been chasing, that the research I've been chasing is, like we have this internal dialogue, I can't cope, I'm not good enough, what if I don't get drugs, what if people think I'm stupid, what if I do with this, how have they got everything and I have nothing? This internal dialogue that's gone on all the time, right? But my mind went really quiet. And what I've learned through my experiences in books I've read and my academic experiences, that language and thinking, our thoughts and our self-talk, our internal dialogue, our emotions and our thinking are intrinsically connected. It's like language is a vehicle for emotion. So if you keep on telling yourself you're stupid, you can't, you're not going to amount to anything, you're going to feel crap. You're going to feel shit about yourself. So when my mind went quiet, all of these negative emotions left me as well. So it just left this space to just feel the world, feel per the perceptual world that was there. And that was that beautiful moment. So... 
it just left me with this burning curiosity to learn about this stuff and to go on a go on a journey to learn about this stuff and I absolutely loved it. But it was not without bumps in the road. Like in the book, I had a relapse in 2015, two years after that, because, and I think this is important to get to get out there, because I know you just had a you had a talk yourselves about, yeah. about, about relapse as well. And what happened was that I got back into the rat race. I was mad into college. I was like, I, I, I switched addictions. I like to say I transformed desires. And you can have a healthy obsession. You can have a healthy addiction with exercise and stuff like that, as long as you're aware of what's going on as well. But I, 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 I lost that gift I was given that day in detox. And I got back into the rat race. And I was trying to work too hard. I was trying to be the best. And I lost sight of where I was. And I remember I was doing deliveries to get myself financially through college. I was going around doing deliveries. And I remember I had flu symptoms one night. And just out of the blue, I went to a chemist, boss all, but then popped three in a bottle like that, dropped them in, drank them, got the little buzz. Didn't think I had a relapse. And over the next few weeks, I was buying Norofen and Salpidin and taking them from me flu, whenever that went on for. And I remember being in Minute University one of the days, walking through, when I did Minute University, gorgeous university on the South Campus, these big, huge, giant sequoia trees, they're like hundreds of feet high. And I remember looking at one of them and it says, I don't see that like I did two years ago. And I had this sudden realisation that I just got dragged back into the rat race through the anxiety, the stress of trying to do well in college. And I was saying, I'm messing around with Solpity and convincing myself that it's not a relapse that I needed to take them and all. And I just had this huge awakening, another awakening again, saying, what the hell have I been doing? And from that moment, I decided to double down on my emotional and mental health. That came first. I was going to leave college, even though I was doing really well. I was going to leave college, set it all behind me. But talked with a couple of people, got advice, and he says, now stay in college, just focus on your mental health first. And in that third year of college, I focused more on the things that were important to me, exercise, meditation, eating right, sleeping right, all of them kinds of things. And everything else was secondary. And I done even better in that third year. And was when I really focused on, on, on being well and looking after the relationships in my life as well, having time for people as well. That's really important as well, nourishing them relationships. That was just a game changer. And from that moment, 2015, I started designing what I call a program for life. And I've just gone on between my academic studies and different things just creating courses creating content writing blogs wrote the book just about all these tools and tactics for life and just a way of living and I live that lifestyle every single day and it's just that's that's been the journey you know you touched on when we talked about it and that's one thing that from when Terence got sober to when he did have that bump on the road yeah. that we sat down and discussed we talked about it on the podcast before but one thing that we took from it is that Terence just went cold turkey from it and you didn't have the tools to cope no. with it, yeah. basically. Yeah. Yeah. And But you knew that you were running from this problem and it was chasing him. And he, like you always knew, I think I kind of knew as well and it was inevitable that it was going to catch you. Yeah. And you didn't, like you had all good intentions, like, right, I'm sober, I need to get my life on track, but you went about it the wrong way. Completely but wrong way. It yeah. wasn't your fault because you thought, and, Everybody from the outside looking in thought, fair play to Terence, he's getting sober, but you knew it was coming. You knew you were going to get caught. I knew you were going to get caught. And we talked about it. We were like, yeah, just have a few bottles one weekend and see how you feel. Because yeah. we thought, remember, I was like, have a drink and see do you like the taste of it. And you were like, oh, you were so afraid of it. Yeah. And you were like, no, no, I won't do that. But yeah. then it caught up on your heart yeah, when it, it did was catch fair- it. I would have done that, but it was the fear of, because you know my personality, that if I enjoy that few bottles, yeah. it's only going one way. Yeah. And But eventually it did catch up on me, and I spoke about it during that episode relapse. I talked about, for about three weeks before it, every morning I woke up saying, I need a drink, yeah. I need a drink. Yeah. I, need. I was missing the taste of it, I was missing... I was almost like I could taste it. Yeah. I was like, I just need to drink. And that's when you relapsed three weeks beforehand. It wasn't the actual drink. It, it was, was the, the, the mind. Yeah, the mind yeah. there was exactly. inevitable. Exactly. And yeah. that just creeped up on me, creeped up on me. And then, boom, one night I yeah. just went on it hard and heavy. And after that was just a complete downfall and mental battle. It was thinking like suicidal thoughts. It was deep depression. I couldn't get out of the bed. I'm at the throne this amount of months sober down the drain. Because I worked so hard to get sober. Yeah. It sounds mad. I wasn't like I wasn't like someone who you'd call an alcoholic. It's almost like a functional alcoholic. I drank six six to seven days a week. Every day I drank after work. I'd go home from work. I'd sit down and have whether it be six or ten bottles every single day. It was at that stage. And it was just like like I basically was a functional alcoholic and then like I don't know, it was just madness like that mm. that 
I, I worked so hard to get sober, and like you said, Dan, I can relate so much to that, but I didn't really want to say it, is that whole thing of when I, because I tried to get sober a couple of times, and I fucked up, and I went back on it again, and I just couldn't help it, and again, the drink and the drugs, just yeah. everything that came, I love to party, I love to be out for days, I thought I loved it. The chaos. It, it, it's horrible, you know, but, like, where was I going to, oh yeah, like you were saying about the, the brighter days, when I... I made the decision. The last time I had a drink when I when I made the decision to get sober was the fourth of July in twenty twenty. And it was only two days or three days after I'd said that I'm never gonna drink again. But I could feel it. Like I know what you were talking about when you were yeah. saying that. I remember looking out my bedroom window and thinking, I remember looking out the window and going, The day feels bright yeah. everything seems better. And I think what that is was our minds knew that that was the last time. To an extent, we had bumps in the roads, but I knew. So, like, when I told people, people sort of laughed and said, right, I'll see you the weekend. Because everyone says the same, you know? You, t- you, hear, you see someone on Monday and you be yeah. like, how's the head? And they're like, off it, off yeah. it. And, yeah, uh, I'm off it. And, and you I know, was like, one of them. And, but, but this time I knew. But I knew that no one else would know. And, yeah. and even I said it to people and they sort of looked at me and said, all right, see you Friday. But I knew. I knew that was the last time, and for days after that, I felt what you're talking about. Mm. I know exactly what you're saying. That's what I'm saying. I can I can resonate with what he's saying because we've had this conversation. Now, not necessarily on the episode that we done together, but just from being with you every yeah. day and talking to you, I feel like I can get that with you as well, Brian. You know, and it's like when you're talking about putting this program and getting these tools in place because. I don't think going, going cold turkey works for everybody. It doesn't. It, it, and you need like these coping mechanisms to like, oh, I, I'm feeling these urges. What do I do? And that's probably why these like uh, AA have like sponsors. You know, yeah. like when you get an urge, you ring somebody and you tell them and they talk to you. They need yeah. to be promoted. Now, I never did that. And I still might do that at some stage. Yeah. If I do get and the that's the thing again. about it. People need to realise that, Terence. You had a slip and... Just because you had a slip and you're back on the road again doesn't mean you're fucking I'm, A1 100%. I'm far from dumb that. I put, a something, I put something up there recently. And I, I ha, do you know what happened to me? I got an out-of-body experience there last week or two weeks ago. I, got, I was sitting in the house and do you know what? I know what it is. I have a, a lack of hobbies. I have a lack of goals. I'm not setting enough goals for myself and I'm not doing this. So I'm, I have a lot of time to think. And last week or two weeks ago, I was in the gaff and I said to myself, I'm going to get a few bottles. And I got up, got dressed, and went to leave the house, and went, what the fuck? It was almost like I went to the autopilot, I was going to the office to get a drink, and I just went, oh, what the fuck is going on? It was like it was two different people. And look, that urge is still there. That yeah. urge has never left me. I've said it before, I love, I love drinking, I love partying, I love it all. The chaos. But the I, chaos, I, yeah. I can't, because I know what it can do to me. I, like, that will never leave me. Like, there's no... I can't sit here and say, I hate it. I hate what it does to me. But I miss it every day, you know what I mean? It's all right to do that. But I still might go to AA meetings, to CA meetings, yeah. and I promote them so highly because of yeah. friends who got sober through Counseling them. Counselling as well. And they can't stop telling me to do them. Like, and I haven't done them yet. I think I will do them. I think I just need to be ready to do them. Mm. But there's no harm in doing that. I think, I think some people might think, I'm not going to them meetings. I'm just going to... And a lot of people think that it's... Because I've spoke about it as well, and I think I was wrong for doing it, but I just said that what I did do was I went cold talking and I didn't do any of that. I think a lot of people think they can do that. Yeah. And then when they get the bumps in the road, they're like, oh, it's just not for me. I'm meant to be on it. It's like, you're not. If you wanted to stop, your mind was telling yeah. you I to don't stop. think you were aware of what was there for you to help. Yeah, you just yeah. Talk. Do you know what? I'll go cold talking and then I'll be six months sober and you're like, I don't need them meetings. Yeah. And I think it's very important to promote the fact that you had a slip and you're in, you're in a better place now than most people and you're still saying that you need these tools. Yeah. So people need to realise these are available and they do work. Yeah, and consistently working on the tools as well. Like what, what And whatever works for you, like some AA works for some people, other people, it's just talking to friends, other people, it's exercise. The different things work for different people because people are always looking for the solution to addiction. Addiction is so different yeah. because addiction isn't even a thing. It's it's a medi- You're medicating something underlying that, whether it's anxiety, whether it's depression, whether it's trauma, whether it's just that sort of personality that looks for madness and all that kind of thing. There's something driving that. So you need to get at the bottom of that and to get the bottom of that you have to put work in in some area of your life but it has to be consistent that's the key thing as well mm. so you're talking about then your tools what tools you're talking what did you you said like, you what would you what would you be your strong base to people out there because there's people out there like Brian I think it's mad right I think it's nuts because 
I get an awful lot of messages and the, and the pets get an awful lot of messages off. Young fellas and young ones, boys and girls, texting us saying, do you know, like people talk to me about this podcast, right? And they say, oh, you're delighted you signed that deal and you're delighted you did this and that and whatever. And I love everything we've done and I'm so proud of the podcast and everything. But the proudest thing for me through this whole podcast is when people text me and tell me I'm, I'm five months sober today after yeah. after listening to your podcast. Um, it's that feeling, right? I, I've, cried in, I've cried in the gaff one night. Yeah. Sitting there, I got a long message and I was... Bro, what's up? I was so bad. I was I was doing coke every single day. I couldn't think straight. I was suicidal. I had all this, and now I'm five months sober after I hit. See them? That is doesn't like you can't put words no, in you it. Can't. You know, it's unbelievable. Yeah, and yeah. It's just like what, like I'm not saying like. I don't know what it is. I think people just see yours as too normal young players and think if they can be sober in their twenties, mm. well then so can we because they know they have a problem, but they think that they can't stop because their life can't be fun anymore. Your, my life has has been a billion times better, fuller than, than ever. Yeah. Exactly, and that's why I think that's why I'm asking you the question about what told you to use because if somebody sees this and our way didn't work, the AA, the CA didn't work, your story here or your tilt here might, they might try that and then someone else can get sober. What yeah. we're trying to promote as well is that you don't, uh, you don't, just because you're sober doesn't mean you don't make stupid decisions when you're out because we're two fucking idiots. <laughs> yeah. No better man to fuck her up. And, and I tell you what, you don't want to take life too seriously either, you know what I mean? Exactly. I see so, some people in recovery and it's great but like angry in recovery and very serious in recovery, you have to have a bit of fun as well, you know what I mean? I, I, I don't even like the word recovery as well. Like even AA is brilliant. All them fellowships are great. It was great for me for a certain amount of time, but there's even a, an element of it. I don't like to say I'm an addict, I'm an alcoholic. My name is this, I'm an alcoholic. You're labeling yourself. I believe I'm post recovery. I'm after recovery. I'm out of that. It's something I've dealt with and it's gone, you know that way. But I still need to work on my mental health to be good with myself. And it's not about being worried about getting back into addiction. That could be something of it. But it's, 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 I, don't, I don't want to be in that bad place of mind. I don't want to be full of anxiety anymore. That's why I work on myself. Addiction, again, is just something that could I could fall into again if I get anxious again because I need a coping mechanism again. So it's about really working on yourself of where you need to be. And, and in terms of the tools, like I've, I've so many tools like that that I have for different elements of life and they're not all for addiction, but I, I did do a course, what you call it, um, developed a course with a, a, a psychologist, um, a, a, one of the best therapists that I know. And there was a couple of things. She sort of went through my story and looked at, from, looked at it from a psychological perspective because I didn't know why I was so happy in recovery, why I'm doing so well. And that's why I didn't really speak about it. And we went through it with her. It was something really interesting that she recognised was that in addiction, I wasn't having my psychological needs met and I'd say you as lads are like me one of my and it's, it's so the psychological needs of a lot of people is is being visible being seen like we're sitting here now with t cameras here you know what I mean we like being seen we're enjoying what we're doing so I would say for yourself man like a big part of your recovery is this podcast it's about having purpose having meaning in your life that's one of it would be a huge part of that as well for me it was so my, one of my psychological needs was being visible so now I'm doing something that I absolutely love it's like I switched addiction so it's keep on changing and that dream keep on working towards something but something that, that I've chatted with Lynn Rowan about a couple of times as well and, and this is what's really hard for some people in addiction as well like you need your basic needs met first like there's no point in me sitting here telling people to practice mindfulness gratitude and all these different things if they're starving and lonely and haven't got money to heat themselves like do you need those basic needs met first and that's where the government need to step up with those kinds of things because once the basic needs are met which they can do in the in the in the injection centers and stuff like that as well, because they have opportunities to home people. Once then basic needs are met, then you need to meet your psychological needs, and that might be whether it's visibility, whether it's social connection with other people. Because there's a great line by a guy called Johan Harry. I don't know if he's read his stuff. Brilliant he is, and he says sobriety is not the opposite of addiction. Connection is, and I love that line because you're never lonelier than you'll ever be when you're in addiction. It's like you're disconnected from yourself, disconnected with other people. So something to some, one key tool is just staying connected with different people. But what I would say is, and around specific kinds of tools, and I think you you touched on it a few times, is, is this awareness. It's like anxiety or addiction. The ops or addiction is unawareness. You are basically unaware. You're just on autopilot, like you says, going to grab a drink. You're just doing stuff without even thinking of it. So building some kind of present moment awareness into your life, so you're aware of how you feel. Like anxiety was my trigger. So I can see anxiety coming and say, oh, here it is, and I'll, I'll swat it away, or I'll let it come and let it go, but I can feel it, and I know it's there, 
And once I know what's there, I can deal with it. Whether it's mad thoughts in my head, what I do with this, well, being aware of that, uh, behaviours I do, where you can look back and say, look, geez, well, look what I've done there. So awareness is the key. So getting some kind of awareness into your life. So whether it's mindfulness, whether it's journaling, sitting with yourself, but just sitting with yourself in silence and just practising being aware. I, I like to practise something called self-observation and I don't want to get too, like or are worldly with this stuff, but it's simply like I observe my inner thoughts, I observe what I'm doing, and, and that's simply what I do. And once you practice that on a regular basis, you will just become more aware of your inner world, and that determines your outer world, and that's one of the key pieces. But what I will say is, and I think it's one of the most powerful tools out there, is gratitude, and it seems like a fluffy kind of a concept, but when you're grateful of something, and you're grateful for what you have. It's one of the most powerful places to be. Like I've often heard people say, like, you can't be fearful. You can't be jealous. You can't be angry while you're being grateful. Like while you're being grateful, it's just an amazing place to be. And I think anything that can really grabs my own personal recovery in one go, it's like gratitude. And the name of my book is called Bonus Time. And that's where I got it. I'm living on bonus time because I was given a second chance at life. It could have been called a gratitude. I'm pure grateful for the opportunity of having a second chance at life. And for anyone out there listening to this that's struggling with addiction, to think of how powerful gratitude is. Think back of when you got your, you've been waiting to get your hit, your score, your score bag, or get your drink, whatever it is, and you're dying to get it and you actually get it. That's pure gratitude. Mm. in the depths of addiction you're like so happy because you have it and it's going to fix your thing well imagine having that clean and sober and you're just grateful for the life that you have and, and believe me I think a lot of people really struggle to think life is going to be so boring without drinking drugs but it's not it's so full it's so amazing and the feelings you have everything is just elevated to the next level mm. like you know I agree with you and everything there yeah especially the gratitude because it's like it's something so simple but I've said it to Calvin Powerful. before as well it's like when you when you wake up on a Sunday morning and go for a swim with the boys and have a coffee, that grateful feeling of going, I'm usually still out in a gaff at this time. Mm, yeah. And I'm sitting here now having a coffee. I don't have the urge. And you're just keeping your mind busy. You, you have your hobbies, you have your goals and things like that. You become grateful for things like that. And you become grateful even in the little things when everybody's out having a party. Or you're at the party and you wrap her up, say, four or five o'clock. I do go on the non-alcoholics and the boys are still out. I'm grateful that I'm going to wake up with no hangover. And the boys are going to be in bits and they're all ringing the next day. Oh, I'm hanging together. I'm looking grateful that that's not me anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, but gratitude, I think, would be one of the biggest things. It's a key piece. And you know what? For, for anyone that's doing well in recovery, I think it's the same stuff. Like, I I, I personally didn't do a full-step fellowship program. You, you, you haven't gone there either. But, yeah. but what, what it is, I remember in the Rutland Centre where I'd done part of my PhD and I was looking at the 12 steps. And I was saying, I literally do the 12 steps. What it is, it's like... It's being aware. It's practicing meditation. It's going out and helping other people. It's it's um it's sort of, oh, I forget I forget how uh, mostly now, but I remember. Yeah. But the, the main thing about it is it's a program of action. And for me, whatever you do in recovery, if you're struggling with drugs and you get into recovery, you've got, you're gonna have to act. But what happens is it's people that think oh you're gonna have to act and you're gonna have to practice these tools all the time. But they just become what you do, and it just becomes a great part of your mm. life, and it just becomes what you want to do. That is the real thing. It just becomes what you want to. Do when it's just a new life. Mm. That's unbelievable. Mm. That. <laughs> Very powerful. Uh, it is. It's, it's powerful. So much <laughs> shivers and all yeah. that now, you know. I just want to touch on stuff as well, Brian. So you said you went to college because before we started, yeah, we were talking about where you came from to what you're achieving now, and they're two different people. It's <laughs> yeah. On paper, it's like this is Brian Penny, but I don't know who this other fella is. <laughs> it is like that. It is. It is so yeah. we're gonna touch into that. Can you tell us? How you got into college and academia and what you're up to now, say, it's probably since you got sober, really, wouldn't it? Yeah. It's really kind of kicked off. Yeah, yeah, big time. I remember straight away, I just wanted to learn more. Like, I was reading about self-awareness, psychological stuff, the mind, all this stuff about the mind, and I was infatuated with it, and I wanted to learn more. And I says, right, degree in psychology. So uh, I applied for college straight away. The, it was uh, 2013, I got clean. Around Christmas time, I got out, and I applied in March. And the only place I could get into was Minute University. And I remember I had no money, I was in debt and all this kind of thing, so I had to get the back to education allowance, so I was trying to sort all that stuff out. And I'll never forget, they were saying, no, you won't be able to get the back to education allowance because you missed this by a couple of amount of days or something like that. And I remember just hassling the debt over in the, the, the intro service <laughs> no, or whatever it was, yeah. yeah. And I remember your man saying to me, look, there's nothing 
nothing I can do. If I was the president of the United States, I couldn't even help you. There's nothing I can do. Our hands are tired. And I remember I went over one more time, right? And he walked down. I asked, can I see whoever? And he walked down. He see me. He says, oh, good Lord. And he had a sandwich in his pot, in his hand, right? And he, I remember he looked at me, right? And he sort of says, he looked at his sandwich. That's how I remember that. And he was like, he looked at his sandwich. He says, tell you what, I'll do you a favour. He says, I'll sort this out for you. So a rumbling stomach got me into college because I was <laughs> able to get the back to education. You came between a man and get, his yeah, that's, that's, it, it that's it, that's it, that's <laughs> it. And I got in. But um, yeah, I went to Minucci University and I really struggled. Um, when I when I got the opportunity to get in there, they told me now you're going to have to do an access course because you can't write, you can't do this. And I struggled writing emails. And they sent me for a two-week course and I really struggled. I couldn't write well and I didn't do very well in there. But I remember thinking, right, I'm going to start from the bottom up. And I went to every little class over there, how to write, how to do this, how to do emails, how to jump on their system for doing references, all the little extras that they had. And I started from the bottom up and I'd done all of that. And I struggled in the first year, but I'd done pretty well. And it got me into second year psychology. But I just kept on working, grafting again and again and again. Now, I nearly had me little relapse because I worked too bloody hard, so that's another element of it as well. But I started to do very, very well, and I started to get great grades. Like, I got top of the class in second year, and then when I doubled down on my emotional health in third year, when after my mini relapse, I'd done even better again. And I got a scholarship for Trinity College. It was worth 100 grand, actually. The scholarship was worth, <laughs> yeah. I done, I done well. Now, that paid for the fees and gave me a bit of a wedge to do the research. So I've been doing that for the last four years. And I just finished. I'm finishing this September so now. you went from uh, doing a degree in psychology in Minute to... To a PhD. In, it's in psychology. It's neuroscience and psychology in Trinity College. So... That's <laughs> unbelievable. Like this is a fella who was addicted to heroin. And now he's gonna be he's gonna have a doctorate in neuroscience. Yeah, it's nuts, man. So that's why I'm saying it's not the same person. It's not the same person, it's not the same person. So you're gonna be Dr. Penny. Dr. Penny, yeah. <laughs> totally. <laughs> it's Love mad. It. When you say it like that, it's absolutely mad. It's yeah, mad. It sounds like the it name of a sitcom, doesn't it? But, <laughs> but, but the, the one thing is, and I'd like to put that across to people, like it's like even which is a podcast as well, and anything anybody I talk to that has some kind of a success story, there's a lot of work that goes into that as well. So it's like showing up every single day. But if you keep on putting one step in front of the other, you will climb Mount Everest like if whatever your goal is if you just keep on turning up and consistently doing that all the time because a lot of people think oh you're super smart doing a PhD mm. in, in, in neuroscience like I wouldn't say I'm, I'm stupid like I had a bit of smarts about me but I was not nearly the best in the class in Minute. I remember some very clever people in that class but I was more strategic about it and I just kept on showing up every single day and it adds up but compounds over time Ron, you know I swear to God it's, you're, you're preaching to the choir here yeah. me I mean me shout out well, we'll give him a shout out. Probably will shout out to James anyways. We went to college together. Don't want to make it bring him down what I'm about to say next, but yeah. we wouldn't have been the smartest there. Yeah. But we were grafters and we looked after each yeah. other. And Persistence. Yeah, and now the two of us are on the same team and the same company, you know what I mean? Yeah. And if we look back and you'd say, right, give, I always use this example for school, but you can use it in college as well. Say, right, pick 10 people out here who are going to succeed. We wouldn't be in that top 10. Yeah. And that's no disrespect to him because he know, he, he, I know he'll think the same. And but we showed up, we grafted, and we were strategic about it. You yeah. know, we knew what we had to do. And maybe I don't know. Maybe that's the 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 fight that's in you. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, we and it, it, you know what you can you can resonate with what Emma Brennan was saying last week as well. Emma Brennan was saying he's not the best boxer in the world, but he has yeah. a good work ethic. And you know what grafters? It's just in you. You know? Yeah, yeah. It makes it makes such a big deal. And then do you know what happens as well. Then the opportunities present themselves because when people see a graph and people see you put the work in as well, they want to lift you up as well. And it's, you just get help along the way. I've had trema- I've had amazing help from my family, from other people I just reached out. I've had amazing help along the way from very unlikely sources as well, like business leaders and stuff like that who... I, I don't know how I'm even t- c- conversing with these lads. Don't even mind. Like, j- here's an example for you, right? So, John Boyle, the founder of Boyle Sports, right? The company's worth over a billion. Over a billion. I reached out to John Boyle, saying, John, can I meet you for an interview? I'd love to uh, talk about the tools that have helped you in your life, right? So I met John Boyle, thinking I'm going to get 15 minutes with him, right? He says, Brian, what's your birthday? I told him my birthday. He says, now your real birthday. Instinctively, I knew what he was talking about. I said, 8th of October, when I got clean. He says, mine's the 23rd of September, 37 years clean. I had a three hour conversation with him and he's he, he's invited me over to Florida it was Gaff in Florida at some stage just a lovely person lovely man built a business 
And what you call, he says, you know what? Do you know why you're, you're sitting here today? Because you're living on bonus time. That's what gave me the name of the book like as well. So it's just, if you re give people a chance to be nice, reach out to people. And now I've had loads of people saying no to me along the journey. Loads of rejections. But I don't see them as rejection because if you don't ask, the answer is always no. Yeah. So milk never yeah, gets fed. Reach out and ask people. Just mm. take a risk, take a chance, but keep on showing up every day, you know? Mm. And can you tell us a bit, because uh, we talked off, offer about how I found out who you are. So you were giving a talk to my board's gym during lockdown. They were doing like an online seminar thing. And I heard you going into the details of neuroscience yeah. and you were giving leading <laughs> graphs and stuff and diagrams of the brain in addiction and yeah. out of addiction. And I was blown away. I was like, oh my God, this is a whole other aspect of addiction that people don't look at. Yeah. And what the first thing that came into my head was, Get him on the podcast. And that's probably when we reached out to you. That was, this is how long this is in yeah, the making. Yeah. And the second thing I thought is, imagine if other people knew this is what's going on in someone's head when they're addicted, the yeah. chemical imbalance that's going on. They think twice before they call someone a junkie. Yeah, th this is it. This is it. And and, and he here's the thing, like, so just for, for credibility things, well, I don't just generally talk about neuroscience. So I teach, I teach uh, neuroscience of addiction in Trinity and I teach the neuroscience of mindfulness in UCD. And they really go together because I think mindfulness is like awareness is the opposite of addiction, you know what I mean? And, and basically, I was very lucky. When I was in detox, two days before I got clean, Dr. Johanna Ivers came into the detox center and asked me to be part of a brain study. He asked all the people I met to be part of a brain study. And she's the person that asked me to teach in Trinity College. So I came full circle class. on that one's class, yeah. So I was part of a brain study, an fMRI study. I take a scan of your brain. So I got a scan of my brain back then in 2013. And I've access to a scanner now in the Institute of Neuroscience. So it took me scanning my brain two years ago. And the differences in my brain in my brain over time, I'd actually reduced the age of my brain. There's a thing called brain pad scores where they, they measure the gray density matter of your brain and predict the age of your brain. And over the last five years, I've basically reduced the age of my brain by 10 years. And that predicts mortality rate, cognitive decline, all of these different things. So we've reduced the age of my brain. But just going back to what you said about what what happens in the brain as well, like it's literally you 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 get hijacked. Like if you if you if you're if you're feeling anxious and you're feeling stressed, you're it's a pumping, it's a fight and flight response, pumping cortisol throughout your body. Well, if you do drugs, that basically hijacks the reward system of your brain. It pumps your brain full of dopamine, makes you feel great, makes you feel loads of pleasure, pleasure stops that horrible system. So it's a huge reward. And what happens if we're rewarded? Every like psychology shows you that. At behavior that is rewarded is repeated so you're going to do it over and over again and then that sort of takes over the, the, the that part of your brain the reward part of the brain and it just amplifies the urge to use over and over and over again so it's like yeah you, you sort of haven't got a chance like you know what i mean mm. it's really hard and then people are saying oh the junkies they're only this and it's choice and all this there's there's very little choice in it no very little so choice Hard of, like you're at the wheel and then you start doing hard of and hard of is at the wheel takes yeah. the wheel yeah yeah and yeah. that's what people need to look because I know and any drugs not, not just heroin well, yeah, it's all yeah. drugs yeah, Hero it's, but heroin is the one that yeah, when you're on the, on the streets that's the, the one that yeah, we see yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so that's I know we shouldn't shouldn't do this but I, I couldn't help myself but I read the comment section on the, uh, one of the videos that we have on YouTube mm. and I, I don't know even I should highlight it but I will it was on the off the ball one and Somebody said, I walked in, because we're from the inner city, there's a lot of praise about the attention that we're bringing to it. And one of the comments was, I walked in the inner city, it's, it's a cesspool, it's a lost cause, it's just full of junkies. And I was just thinking like, right, how did you walk there for two years and that's all that you thought about yeah. this place? Could you not look and see the suffering? Like, when we had Nicola Talent on, the first thing she said to me on the phone was, she went past Merchant's Key and she was heartbroken because how these people are suffering and how we need to change it. So it was like, there's somebody who can look at this and see there's a problem. How can everybody else not look at it? You know what I mean? Don't be quick to say, there's someone who's a junkie. There's someone who's hurt. Yeah. And there's someone who needs help. Yeah. And maybe because when you see them, they're under the influence of heroin yeah. or another drug. But you need to realise, sober, that's a person who's looking for help and they're suffering. Did you ever have a conversation with them? But did none of these people have ever had a conversation with these people that they're talking about and calling junkies? Yeah. Have you ever actually sat down with these people that are so normal, they're so real? They, and they're, most of them are very open and they're just like, I'm just fucked, I'm just caught yeah. up. I just, 
They it's don't trust. They don't lie to you. They, they won't lie to you. They yeah. never lie to you. You know. It, look, I tell you, for people that are like that, trust me on it. These people aren't gonna hurt you. They're not gonna harm you. Go in and get them a coffee and sit down outside with them, or sit down somewhere with them and just have a conversation with them and watch. I guarantee you'll take something away, man. Something where they, you walk away with a lump in your throat because oh my god, you wouldn't think it. And you're not just looking at them like this junkie, like they're calling yeah. them. You'll walk away and you'll go, my god, there really is a person underneath there. And the wisdom in there as well. Like a lot Some of people, of them the, are the, really the wisdom smart. that. That's there, like you know what I mean. It's just, but he just can't get out of home. It's so hard. Some of the smartest people I've met, Brian, never step out in the classroom. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like, there's, there's people out there educated academically, but they're not educated in life. Yeah. And there's so much to be said for people who have life experience. Yeah. You know, I know people who they're in the job 15 to 20 years, no qualifications. So you say to yourself, well, then how are you in the job? It's because you're good at your job. Yeah. And you know somebody who get their foot in the door because of a piece of paper that they have. Mm. And that's coming from me. I have a degree. Yeah. That's what got me in. Well, I don't know. I look at how I look at I got to where I am is obviously I've done something right to somebody because I have a piece of paper that a lot of other people have. Yeah. Yeah. But there's not a lot of people in my position. Yeah, and, and here's the thing for me, what you call a, well, it, it, nearly eight years in academia, when I'm talking to people and I'm talking about lessons I've learned and stuff like that, it's very, very little I've learned that I actually use a strong on life experiences. And if, if you want if you want to really read the best stuff, like the, the, the most important messages in the world, like the best minds in the world have left our best messages in books. It's just pick up a book and read it. You'll learn more than any degree will teach you as well. Mm. Degrees, you need them to show credibility in certain areas like that, but there's no, it's nothing to do with wisdom. Nothing no. Nothing to do with wisdom or real life yeah. lessons. Well, that's it. The, the life lessons I've been taught haven't been from a classroom. Yeah, exactly, yeah. You from know. the school of hard knocks. Yeah. yeah. And I know yeah. we say this a lot in this podcast every day is a skill day but Brian you literally have took us a skill here today mate Cheers, Fuck, it's man. genuinely man I've, I've never heard that in yeah. my life I'm not having shivers for a lot but like it was it was unbelievable to sit there and listen to that and I'm really it was powerful like, yeah. so the way our whole life is just done a 360 and it like like we said earlier on, like really, if this, because we know we're helping people in terms of with alcohol addiction and all that. Like if if we, I could, if we could get one message one day from someone who said they listened to a podcast, especially like this one, and said that they come off heroin or off methadone or they got the, they got the, they got the mind to do it eventually mm. from listening to yeah. that. You can do it. That it's possibility. Mm. Like that. That would like it's unbelievable. Do you know it can help one person. Should resonate with people as well. The fact that you said. A fella come up to you and he said, I'm I'm gonna die. I there's no hope for me. Yeah. So that's someone you'd see in the street and people walk past and say, Fuck him, he's he's a lost cause. But does it not make them think he's listening to the same podcast you're listening to? <laughs> like how is he listening to a podcast? It's madness. Do you know like, things like that? It's, it's madness. That's how normal these people actually are yeah. under it all. He's listening to our podcast, he's probably laughing at our eyes, he was talking shit about pissing yeah. in the show and shit like that. But having that same human experience exactly, for the best part exactly. of it, yeah. he's still yeah. a human so not just that we don't just need that individual himself to change to try and get off the substances he's on mm. if another person could change their attitude and say do you know what I actually want to help that fella yeah. so exactly. we're helping two people here changing his attitude his attitude and that's two people then who can go on and help another person yeah. and we have that domino effect and it will snowball yeah, and, and uh, it's, uh, I, I rarely get into the whole political thing. I stay away from politics as well, but it's teaching people about the bigger picture, like opening up the injection centres. How in God's name is that going to have a negative impact on anyone in any way whatsoever? Like, the research is there in other countries. It shows that if you do this proactively like that, it's going to help. Like, addiction is not about the drugs. It's about the underlying issues. Mm. I've had somebody who said they weren't happy with me mentioning uh, promoting injection centres. They're like, no, no, because you'll have the people hanging around well, you have the people hanging around now I mean, as there is. Yeah, like it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't, it, none of it makes sense. But the thing about it is, so let's just say you had 20 people hanging around a certain area every yeah. day because of heroin. If you put an injection centre in and give it a year, there won't be 20 people there. Yeah. There'll exactly. be less. And, and then them same people are still going to be somewhere else, but they won't have the support that the, that mm. the injection centre will give. And yes, yeah, some of them might go to the injection centre and never actually get clean, but at least they're doing it in a safe environment mm. then as well. It no just has, needles there's on pros. The streets. There's just, yeah, no needles on the streets. There's no negatives for it, in yeah. my opinion. You know? Mm. <sighs> Look. This was a journey, this episode, yeah. anyways, it was unbelievable. Cheers, thanks yeah. for having me, lads, it was great, really enjoyed it. Genuinely, it was worth the wait. It definitely <laughs> was. It was a few months in the walks, but definitely it was worth was. the wait, honestly, yeah. thanks very much for coming in, it was a pleasure. Thanks, thanks a lot, much, lads. Brian. Right. Wrap this up, thanks. Take us out, boys, boom! Subscribe to this podcast for free on the Go Loud app. What you waiting for? What you back in it? Just a little more. 
Deep Knocker.